Chapter 23 of Unicorns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Unicorns by James Hunnaker. Chapter 23. The Reformation of George Moore. Part 1. Dear Naughty George Moore. Sad, bad, mad. Has reformed. He tells us why in his book Valet the English edition of which I was lucky enough to read, for the American edition is expurgated, nay, fumigated, as was the memoirs of my dead life by the same Celtic Casanova. Valle completes the trilogy, Hail and Farewell, Ave and Salve, being the titles of the preceding two. In the first, Moore is sufficiently vitriolic, and in Salve he serves up George Russell, the poet and painter, better known as A.E., in a more sympathetic fashion. When Valle was announced several years ago as on the brink of completion, I was moved to write, I suppose when the final book appears it means that George Moore has put up the shutters of his soul, not to say his shop, but I have serious doubts. After reading Valle, I still had them. Only death will end the streaming confessions of this writer. He who lives by the pen shall perish by the pen. This latter sentence is not a quotation from the sacred books of any creed, merely the conviction of a slave chained to the inkwell. I said that Valle was expurgated for American consumption. Certainly, we are so averse to racy, forcible English in America, thanks to the mean, narrow spirit in our arts and letters, that a hearty oath scares us into the Brooklyn backyard of our timid conscience. George calls a spade a spade and he delights on stirring up rank, malodorous soil with his war-worn agricultural implement. When he returned some years ago to Dublin, there to help in the national literary and artistic movement, he found a devoted band of brethren, William Butler Yeats, Lady Gregory, Douglas Hyde, John M. Singh, Edward Martin, Russell, and others. I shan't attempt even a brief mention of the Neo-Celtic Awakening, Yeats was the prime instigator, also the storm center. He literally discovered Singh, the dramatist, in reality the only strong man of the group, the only dramatist of originality, and with his exquisite lyric gift, he also discovered a new Ireland, a fabulous, beautiful Erin, unsuspected by Tom Moore, Samuel Lover, Carlton, Mangan, Lever, and the too-busy Bouzecal. As I soon found out when there, Dublin is a vast whispering gallery. Delightful, hospitable Dublin is also a provincial town, given to gossip and backbiting. Say something about somebody in the smoking room of the Shelbourne, and a few hours later the clubs will be repeating it. Mr. Moore said things every hour in the day, and in less than six days he had sown for himself a fine crop of enemies. To get even, he conceived the idea of writing a series of novels with real people bearing their own names, that he hasn't been shot at, horsewhipped, or sued for libel thus far, is just his usual good luck. Valle is largely a book of capricious insults. But then the facts it sets down in cruel type. When the years have removed the actors therein from the earthly scene, our grandchildren will chuckle over Moore's unconscious humor and Pepys like chronicling of small beer. For the social historian, this trilogy will prove a mine of gossip. Rich, voracious gossip. It throws a calcium glare on the soul of the author, who, self-confessed, is now old and no longer a dangerous Don Juan. In real life he was, as far as I can make out, not particularly a monster of iniquity, but, oh, in his confessions and memoirs, what a rake he was! How the lascivious lute did sound! Some of the pages of the new volume, in which he describes his tactics to avoid a kiss, kissing gives him a headache in these lonesome latter years, though he was only born in 1857, is to set you wondering over the frankness of the man. Walter Pater once called him audacious George Moore, and audacious he is, with pen and ink. Otherwise, like Bernard Shaw, he is not looking for physical quarrels. He once spoke of Shaw as the funny man in a boarding house, though he never mentions his name in his memoirs. He doesn't like Yeats. What's more, he prints the news as often and as elaborately as possible. In the present book, he doesn't exactly compare Yeats to a crane or a pelican, but he calls attention to the fact that the poet belonged to the lower middle class. 
It seems that Yeats had been thundering away at the artistic indifference of the Dublin bourgeoisie. Now, looking at Yeats the night when John Quinn gave him a dinner at Delmonico's, you could not note any resemblance to exotic birds, though he might recall a penguin. He was very solemn, very bored, very fatigued, his eyes deep sunken from fatigue. Posing as a tame parlor poet for six weeks had tired the man to his very bones. But catch him in private with his waistcoat unbuttoned, I speak figuratively, and you will enjoy a born raconteur, one who slowly distills witty poison at the tip of every anecdote, till, bursting with glee, you cry, how these literary men do love each other, how one Irishman dotes on another. Yeats may be an exception to the rule that a poet is as vain and as irritable as a tenor. I didn't notice the irritability, finding him taking himself seriously, as should all apostles of culture and Celtic twilight. He got even with George Moore's virulent attacks by telling a capital story, which he confessed was invented, one that went all over Dublin and London. When George felt the call of a Protestant conversion, he was in Dublin. He has told us of his difficulties, mental and temperamental. One day, some question of dogma presented itself, and he hurried to the cathedral for advice. He sent in his name to the archbishop, and that forgetful dignitary exclaimed, more, more, oh, that man again. Well, give him another pair of blankets. In later versions, coals, candles, and even shillings were added to the apocryphal anecdote, which, by the way, set smiling the usually impassive Moore, who can see a joke every now and then. Better still is the true tale of George, who boasts much in valet of his riding dangerous mounts, and when challenged at an English country house, did get on the back of a vicious animal and ride to the hounds the better part of the day. He wouldn't, quite properly, take the dare, although when he reached his room, he found his boots full of blood. So there is sporting temper in him. Anyone reading his Esther Waters may note that he knows the racing stable by heart. In Valle, he describes his father's stable at Castle Moor, County Mayo. Of course, this is not the time to attempt an estimate of his complete work, for who may say what fresh outbursts, what new imprudences in black and white we may expect? He has paid his respects to his fellow countrymen and is heartily despised by all camps, political, religious, artistic. He has belittled the work of Lady Gregory, Yeats, and Edwin Martin, and has rather patronized John M. Singh, the latter possibly because Singh was discovered by Yeats, not more. Yet we do enjoy the vagaries of George Moore. I only saw him once a long time ago, to be precise, in 1901 at Bayreuth. He looked more like a bird than Yeats, though his beak is not so predacious as Yeats. A golden crested bird, with a chin as diffident as a poached egg, and with melancholy pale blue eyes and an undecided gait. He talked to the Irish language as if it were the only redemption for poor unhappy Ireland. In Valle there is not the same enthusiasm. He dwells with more delight on his early Parisian experiences. It is the best part of the book, and to my way of thinking, the essential George Moore is to be found only in Paris. London is an afterthought. The Paris of Manet, Monet, Degas, Whistler, Heisman, Zola, Verlaine, and all the new men of 1880, what an unexplored vein he did work for the profit and delectation of the English-speaking world. True critical yeoman's work, for to preach Impressionism 25 years ago in London, was to court a rumpus. What hard names were rained upon the yellow head of George Moore, that color so admired by Manet and so wonderfully painted by him in the academic camp. He replied with all the vivacity of vocabulary which your true Celt usually has on tap. He even went for the Pre-Raphaelites, a band of overrated mediocrities, on the pictorial side at least, though John Millay was a talent and for years was a solitary prophet in a city of Philistines. The world caught up with Moore, and today the shoe pinches on the other foot. It is George who is a belated critic of the new art, most of it as stale as the Medes and Persians, and many are the wordy battles waged at the Café Royal, London, when Augustus John happens of an evening and finds the author of modern painting denouncing Debussy in company with Matisse and other post-imitators. Manet, like Moore, is old hat, though chapeau, for modern youth. It is well to go to bed not too late in life, else some impertinent youngster may cry aloud, What's that venerable granddaddy doing up at this time of night? 
to each generation its critics. Part 2. In one of his fulminations against Christianity, Nietzsche said that the first and only Christian died on the cross. George Moore thinks otherwise. At least he gives a novel version of the narrative in the Synoptic Gospels. The Brook Kareth is a fiction dealing with the life of Christ. It is a book that will offend the faithful and one that will not convince the heterodox. In it, George Moore sets forth his ideas concerning the Christ myth, evoking, as does Flaubert and Salambeau, a vanished land, a vanished civilization, and in a style that is artistically beautiful. Never has he written with such sustained power, intensity, and nobility of phrasing, such finely tempered, modulated prose. It is a rhythmed prose which first peeped forth in some pages of Mr. Moore's Evelyn Inns, when the theme bordered on the mystical, yet it is of an essentially Celtic character. Mysticism and Moore do not seem bedfellows. Nevertheless, Mr. Moore has been haunted from his first elaborate novel, A Drama in Muslin, by mystic and theological questions. A pagan by temperament, his soul is the soul of an Irish Roman Catholic. He can no more escape the fascinating ideas of faith and salvation than did Huysman's. He has taken exception to this statement in an open letter. A realist from the beginning, he has leaned of late years heavily on the side of the spirit. But like Baudelaire, Barbé d'Arvillé, Vier de la Zile la Dame, Paul Verlaine, and Huysmans, Mr. Moore is one of those sons of Mother Church who give anxious pause to his former co-religionists. The Brook Carath will prove a formidable rock of offense, and it may be said that it was on the index before it was written. And yet we find in it George Moore among the prophets. Perhaps Mr. Moore has read the critical work of Professor Arthur Drew's The Christ Myth. It is a masterpiece of destruction. There are many books in which Jesus Christ figures. Ernest Renan's Life, written in his silky and sophisticated style, is no more admired by Christians than the cruder study by Strauss. After these, The Deluge, ending with the dream by the late Rémy de Gourmand, Une nuit à Luxembourg. And there is the brilliant and poetic study of Edgar Saltis, his Mary Magdalene. Anatole France has distilled into his The Revolt of the Angels some of his acid hatred of all religions, with blasphemous and obscene notes not missing. It may be remembered that Monsieur France also wrote that pastel of irony, The Procurator of Judea, in which Pontius Pilate is shown in his old age, rich, unweed, sick, he is quite forgotten when asked about the Jewish agitator who fancied himself the Son of God and was given over to the temple authorities in Jerusalem and crucified. Rising from the tomb on the third day, he became the Christ of the Christian dispensation, aided by the religious genius of one Paul, formerly known as Saul the tent-maker of Tarsus. Now Mr. Moore does in a larger mold and in the grand manner what Anatole France accomplished in his miniature. The ironic method a tragic irony, suffuses every page of the brook Kareth, and the story of the four Gospels is twisted into something perverse and, for Christians, altogether shocking. It will be called blasphemous, but we must remember that our national constitution makes no allowance for so-called blasphemers, that the mythologies of the Greeks and Romans, Jews and Christians, Mohammedans and Mormons may be criticized, yet the criticism is not inherently blasphemous. America is no more a Christian nation than a Jewish nation or a nation of free thinkers. It is free to all races and religions, and thus one man's spiritual meat may be another's emetic. Having cleared our mind of Kant, let us investigate the Brook Kareth. The title is applied to a tiny community of Jewish mystics, the Essenes, who lived near this stream, perhaps the scriptural Kedron. This brotherhood had separated from the materialistic Pharisees and Sadducees, not approving of burnt sacrifices or temple worship. Furthermore, they practiced celibacy till a schism within their ranks drove the minority away from the parent body to shift for themselves. A young shepherd, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph, a carpenter in Galilee, and of Miriam, his mother, they have other sons, is a member of this community. But too much meditation on the prophecies of Daniel and the meeting with a wandering prophet, John the Baptist, the precursor of the long foretold Messiah, led him astray. Baptized in the waters of Jordan, Jesus becomes a theomaniac. He believes himself to be the Son of God, appointed by the Heavenly Father to save mankind, especially his fellow Jews. Filled with a fanatical fire, he leads away a dozen disciples, poor, ignorant fishermen. He also attracts the curiosity of Joseph, the only son of a rich merchant in Arimathea. 
Two-thirds of the novel are devoted to the psychology of this youthful philosopher who, inducted into the wisdom of the Greek sophists, is, notwithstanding, a fervent Jew, a rigid upholder of the law and the prophets. The dialogues between father and son rather recall Aaron, hardly Syria. Joseph becomes interested in Jesus, follows him about, and the fatal day of the crucifixion, he beseeches his friend Pilate to let him have the body of his Lord for a worthy interment. Pilate demures, then accedes. Joseph, with the aid of the two holy women, Mary and Martha, places the corpse of the dead divinity in a sepulchre. If Joseph hadn't been killed by the zealots of Jerusalem, heeded to this murder by the high priest, the title of the book might have been Joseph of Arimathea. He is easily the most viable figure. Jesus is too much of a god from the machine, but he serves the author for the development of his ingenious theory. Finding the Christ still alive, Joseph carries him secretly and after dark to the house of his father, hides him, and listens unmoved to the fantastic tales of a resurrection. But the spies of Caiaphas are everywhere. Jesus is in danger of a second crucifixion, so Joseph takes him back to the Essenes, where he resumes his old occupation of herding sheep. Feeble in mind and body, he gradually wins back health and spiritual peace. He regrets his former arrogance and blasphemy, and ascribes the aberration to the insidious temptings of the demon. It seems that in those troubled days the cities and countryside were infested by madmen, messiahs, redeemers, preaching the speedy destruction of the world. For a period Jesus called himself the Son of God and threatened his fellow men with fire and the sword. Till he was five and fifty years, Jesus lived with his flocks. The idyllic pictures are in Mr. Moore's most charming vein, sober as befits the dignity of the theme. He has fashioned an undulating prose, each paragraph a page long, which flows with some of the clarity and music of a style once derided by him, the style coulant of that master of harmonies, Cardinal Newman. He is a great landscape painter. Jesus is aging. He gives up his shepherd's crook to his successor and contemplates a retreat where he may meditate the thrilling events of his youth. Then Paul of Tarsus intervenes. He is vigorously painted. A refugee from Jerusalem with Timothy lost somewhere in Galilee, he invades the Essenian monastery. Eloquent pages follow. Paul relates his adventures under the banner of Jesus Christ, a disputatious man, full of the Lord, yet not making it any easier for his disciples. You catch a glimpse of Pauline Christianity differing from the tender message of Jesus, that Jesus of whom Havelock Ellis wrote. Jesus found no successor. Over the stage of those gracious and radiant scenes swiftly fell a fireproof curtain, wrought of systematic theology and formal metaphysics, which even the divine flames of that wonderful personality were unable to melt. If this be the case, then Paul was, if not the founder, the foster father of a new creed, a seer of epileptic visions. Edgar Saltis has said of the sacred disease that all founders of religions have been epileptics. Paul, with the intractable temperament of a stubborn Pharisee, was softened by some Greek blood, yet as Renan wrote of Amiel. He speaks of sin, of salvation, of redemption and conversion, and other theological bric-a-brac, as if these things were realities. For Paul and those who followed him, they were and are realities, and from them is spun the web of our modern civilization. The dismay of Paul on learning from the lips of Jesus that he it was who, crucified, came back to life may be fancy. The sturdy apostle, who recalled the reproachful words of Jesus issuing from the blinding light on the road to Damascus, Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me, naturally enough denounced Jesus as a madman, but accepted his services as a guide to Caesarea, where, in the company with Timothy, he hoped to embark for Rome, there to spread the glad tidings, there to preach the gospel of Christ and him crucified. On the way, he cautiously extracts from Jesus, whose memory of his cruel tormentors is halting, parts of his story. He believes him a half-crazy fanatic, deluded with the notion that he is the original Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus gently expounds his theories, though George Moore pulls the wires. A pantheism that ends in nirvana, neant, nada, nothing. Despairing of ever forcing the world to see the light, he has become a quietist, almost a Buddhist, he might have quoted the mystic Joachim Flora of the Third Kingdom, who said that the true ascetic counts nothing his own, save only his harp. Que viri monachus es nihil reputat esse sum nisi catharum. When a man's cross becomes too heavy a burden to carry, then let him cast it away. Jesus cast his cross away, his spiritual ambition. 
believing that too great love of God leads to propagation of the belief, then to hatred and persecution of them that won't believe. The Jews, says Jesus, are an intolerant, stiff-necked people. They love God, yet they hate men. Horrified at all this, Paul parts company with the Son of Man, secretly relieved to hear that he is not going, as he had contemplated, to give himself up to Hanan, the high priest in Jerusalem, to denounce the falseness of the heretical sect named after him. Paul, without crediting the story, saw in Jesus a dangerous rival. The last we hear of the divine shepherd is a rumor that he may join a roving band of East Indians and go to the source of all beliefs, to Asia, impure, mysterious Asia, the mother of mystic cults. Paul, too, disappears, and on the little coda, the rest of his story is unknown. We are fain to believe that the rest of his story is very well known in the wide world. The book is another milestone along Mr. Moore's road to Damascus. If, as Charles Baudelaire has said, superstition is the reservoir of all truths, then we have lost our spiritual bearings in the dark forest of modern rationalism. To be sure, we have a Yankee Pope Joan, a messiah in petticoats, who has uttered the illuminating phrase, My first and forever message is one and eternal, which is no more a parody of holy writ than the Brook Kareth, a book which, while it must have given its author pains to write, so full of Talmudic and Oriental lore, and the lore of the apocryphal Gospels is it, must have been also a joy to him as a literary artist. The poignant irony of Paul's disbelief in the real Jesus is understandable, though it is bound to raise a chorus of protestations. But Mr. Moore never worried over abuse. He has, Celt that he is, followed his vision. In every man's heart there is a lake, he says, and the lake in his heart is a somber one, a very pool of incertitudes. One feels like quoting to him, though it would be unnecessary, as he knows well the quotation, what Barbary de Aravalle once wrote to Baudelaire, and years later of Joris Carel Hoysmans, that he would either blow out his brains or prostrate himself at the foot of the cross. Mr. Moore has in the past made his genuflections, but they were before the Jesus of his native religion. The poetic, though not profound, image he has created in his new book will never seem the godlike man of whom Browning said in Saul, shall throw open the gates of new life to thee, See the Christ and stand. End of chapter 23 Read by Olivia Chapter 24 of Unicorns This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia Unicorns by James Hunnaker Chapter 24 Pillowland In his immortal essay on the flat swamp of convalescence, Charles Lamb speaks from personal experience of the king-like way the sick man sways his pillow, tumbling and tossing and shifting and lowering and thumping and flattening and molding it to the ever-varying requisitions of his throbbing temples. He changes sides oftener than a politician. How true this is, even to the italicized word, I discovered for myself after a personal encounter with a malignant pneumococcus, backed up by his ally, the pleurisy. Such was the novelty of my first serious illness that it literally took my breath away. When I recovered my normal wind, I found myself monarch of all I surveyed. My kingdom a bed, yet seemingly a land without limit. Who dares circumscribe the imagination of an invalid? As to the truth of Mr. Lamb's remarks on the selfishness of the sick man, there can be no denial. His pillow is his throne. From it he issues his orders for the day, his bulletins for the night. The nurse is his prime minister, his right hand. With her moral alliance, he is enabled to defy a host of officious advisers. But woe betide him if nurse and spouse plot against him. Then he is helpless. Then he is past saving. His little pet schemes are shattered in the making. He is shifted and mauled. He is prodded and found wanting. No hope for the helpless devil as his face is scrubbed, his hands made clean, his miserable tangled hair combed straight. In pillow land, what avatar? None, alas. Nevertheless, your pillow is your best friend, your only confidant. In its cool, yielding depths you whisper. Yes, one is reduced to an evasive whisper, such as the cowardice superinduced by physical weakness. Bedpans are not for Bedouins. I'll have none of them. 
and then you swallow the next bitter pill the nurse offers. Suffering ennobles, wrote Nietzsche. I suppose he's right, but in my case the nobility is yet to appear. Meek, terribly meek, sickness makes one. You suffer a sea change, and without richness. The most annoying part of the business is that you were not consulted as to your choice of maladies. Worse remains. You are not allowed to cure yourself. I loathe pneumonia, since I came to grips with the beast. The next time I'll go out of my way to select some exotic fever. Then my doctor will be vastly intrigued. I had a common or garden variety of lung trouble. Pooh, his eyes seemed to say. I read their meaning with the clairvoyance of the defeated. We shall have this fellow on his hind legs in a jiffy. And I didn't want to get well too rapidly. Like St. Augustine, I felt like praying with a slight change of text. Give me chastity and constancy, but not yet. Give, I said to my doctor, health, but let me loaf a little longer. Time takes toll of eternity, and I've worked my pen and wagged my tongue for twice twenty years. I need a rest. So do my readers. The divine rights of cabbages and kings are also shared by mere newspaper men. A litany of massive phrases followed, but in vain. The doctor was inexorable. I had pneumonia. My temperature was tropical. My heart beat in a ragtime rhythm, and my pulse was out of the running. I realized, as I tried to summon to my parched lips my favorite red lattice oath set, as Cabanus put it years ago, man is a digestive tube pierced at both ends. All the velvet vanities of life had vanished. I could no longer think in alliterative sentences. Only walking delegates of ideas filled my hollow skull like dried peas in a bladder. Finally, I concentrated, as the unchristian unscientists say, on the nurse, my nurse. As an old reporter of things theatrical, I had seen many plays with the trained nurse as heroine. One and all, I abhorred them. Even the gentle and artistic impersonation of Margaret Anglin in a piece whose name I've forgotten. I welcomed a novel by Edgar Saltis, in which the nurse is depicted as a monster of crime incarnate. How mistaken I have been! Now the trained nurse seems an angel without wings. She may not be the slender, dainty, blue-eyed, flaxen-haired girl of the footlights. She is often mature and stout and a lover of potatoes. But she is a sister when a man is down. She is severe, but her severity hath good cause. At first you feebly utter the word, Nurse. Later she is any Irish royal family name. Follows, Mary. And that way danger lies for the elderly invalid. When he calls her Marie, he is doomed. Every day the newspapers tell us of marriages made in pillow land between the well-to-do widower, Mr. A. Sclerosis, and Miss Emma Metic of the St. Petronius Hospital staff. Married sons and daughters may protest, but to no avail. A sentimental bachelor or widower in the lonesome latter years hasn't any more chance with a determined young nurse of the unfair sex than a snowbird in hell, as Brother Mencken phrases it. However, every nurse has her day. She finally departs. Your eyes are wet. You are weeping over yourself. The nurse represented not only care for your precious carcass, but also a surcease from the demands of the world. Her going means a return to work, and you hate to work if you are a convalescent of the true blue sort, hence your tears. But you soon recover. You are free. The doctor has lost interest in your case. You throw physic to the dogs. You march at a Lenten tempo about your embattled bed. You begin sudden little arguments with your wife, just to see if you haven't lost any of your old-time virility in the technique of household squabbling. You haven't. You swell with masculine satisfaction, and for at least five minutes you are the man of the house. A sudden twinge, a momentary giddiness, send you scurrying back to your bailiwick, the bedroom, and the familiar light motif is once more sounded and with what humility of accent. Mama! The eternal masculine, the eternal child, you mumble to her that it's nothing. As you recline on that thrice accursed couch, you endeavor to be haughty. But she knows you're simply a sick, grumpy old person of the male species who needs to be ruled with a rod of iron, although the metal be well hidden. The first cautious peep from a window upon the world you left snow white and find in vernal green is an experience almost worth the miseries you have so impatiently endured. A veritable vacation for the eyes, you tell yourself, as the fauna and flora of Flatbush break upon your enraptured gaze. Presently you watch with breathless interest 
the maneuvers of ruddy little Georgie in the next garden, as he manfully deploys a troop of childish contemporaries, his little sister doggedly traipsing at the rear. Sturdy Georgie has the makings of a leader. He may be a captain of commerce, a colonel, and master politician, but he will always be foremost, else nowhere. You are the audience, he imperiously bids his companions, and when rebellion seemed imminent, he punched, without a trace of anger, a boy much taller. I envy Georgie his abounding vitality. Furtively, I raised the window. Instantly, I was spied by Georgie, who cried lustily, Little boy, little boy, come down and play with me. I almost felt gay. You come up here, I called out with one lung. I haven't a stepladder, he promptly replied. The fifth floor is as remote without a ladder as age is separated from youth. Now I'm moralizing. Undismayed, Georgie continued to call, Little boy, little boy, come down and play with me. The most disheartening thing about a first sickness is the friend who meets you and says, I never saw you look better in your life. It may be true, but he shouldn't have said it so crudely. You renounce then and there the doctor with all his pomps of healing. You refuse to become a professional convalescent. You are cured, and once more a commonplace man, one of the healthy herd. Notwithstanding, you feel secretly humiliated. You are no longer king of Pillowland. End of chapter 24. Read by Olivia. Chapter 25 of Unicorns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Unicorns by James Huneker. Cross Currents in Modern French Literature. 1. They order certain things better in France than elsewhere. I mean such teasing and unsatisfactory forms of bookmaking known as inquiries, enquêtes, which is not fair to translate into the lugubrious literalism, inquests, anthologies and books that masquerade as books, as Charles Lamb hath it. Without a trace of pedantry or dogmatism, such works appear from time to time in Paris and are delightful reminders of the good breeding and suppleness of Gallic criticism. To turn to favour and prettiness, a dusty department of literature is no mean feat. What precisely is the condition of French letters since Quetu Mondes published his magisterial work on the French poetic movement from 1867 to 1900? Paris, 1903. Nothing so exhaustive has appeared since, though a half-dozen inquiries, anthologies, and symposiums are in existence. The most comprehensive recently is Florian Parmentier's Contemporary History of French Letters from 1885 to 1914. The author is a poet, one of Lejeune, and an expert swimmer in the multifarious cross-currents of the day. His book is a bird's-eye view of the map of literary France as far as the beginning of the war. He is quite frank in his likes and dislikes, and always has his reasons for his major idolatries and minor detestations. As a corrective to his enthusiasm and hatreds, there are several new anthologies at hand which aid us to form our own opinion of the younger men's prose and verse. And, finally, there is a significant inquiry of Émile Henriot, A quoi rêve le jeune Jean, 1913, of which more anon. Am Florian Parmentier is a native of Valenciennes, a writer whose versatility and fecundity are noteworthy in a far from barren literary epoch. He has, with the facility of a lettered young Frenchman, tried his hand at every form. All themes, so they be human, are welcome to him from art criticism to playwriting. He is seemingly fair to his colleagues. Perhaps they may not admit this, but the question may be answered in the affirmative. Is he a safe critical guide in the labyrinth of latter-day French letters? He notes, with an unaccustomed sense of humor and a critical barometer, the tendency of youthful poets, prose penmen, and others to form schools, to create cenacles, to begin fighting before they have any defined ideal. It leads to a lot of noisy, explosive manifestos, declarations, and challenges, most of them rather in the air, though it cannot be denied that these ebullitions of gusty temperaments do clear that same air, murky with theories and traversed by an occasional flash of genius. After paying his respects to the daily Parisian press, which he belabors as vino, cynical and impure, our critic evokes a picture of the condition of literary men, not a reassuring one. 
indeed we wonder how young people can dream of embracing such a profession with its heartaches disappointments inevitable poverty unless these aspiring chaps have a private income how do they contrive to live the answer is they don't live unless they write twaddle for the grand old public which must be tickled with fluff and flattery you say to yourself after all paris is not vastly different in this respect from benign new york detective stories melodrama the glorification of the stale triangle in fiction and drama the apotheosis of the apache what are all these but slight variants of the artistic pabulum furnished by our native merchants in mediocrity consoled because your mental and emotional climate is not as inartistic as it is painted you return to florian parmentier and his divagations he has much to say some of it is not as tender as tripe but none is salted with absurdity then you make a discovery there is in france a distinct class the intellectuals who control artistic opinion because of its superior claims a class to which there is no analogy either in england or in america the french academy is not particularly referred to just now poets journalists wealthy amateurs bohemians and professors all may belong to it if they have the necessary credentials brains talent enthusiasm it is the latter quality that floats out on the sea of speculation many adventuring barks each sports the tiny pennant proclaiming its ideals each is steered by some dreamer of proud impossible dreams but they float do these frail boats laden with visions and captained by noble ambitions or another image a long narrow street on either side houses of manifold styles fantastic or sensible castellated or commonplace baroque stately turreted spired and lofty these eclectic architectures reflect the souls of the dwellers within the ivory tower is not missing though a half century ago it was more in evidence the church is there though sadly dwarfed france is still spiritually crippled and flying on one wing this means previous to nineteen fourteen and a host of other strange and familiar houses that jack the poet built on the doors of each is a legend it may be neo-symbolism neo-classicism free verse sincerism intensism spiritualists floralism or the school of grace dramatism and simultanism imperialism dynamism futurism regionalism pluralism serenism viventism magism totalism subsequentism argonauts wolves visionarism and most disgust of all unanimism headed by that fiery propagandist and poet jules roman now every one of these cults in miniature has its following its programs sometimes its special reviews monthly or weekly they are the numerous progeny of the elder romantic realistic and symbolistic schools long dead and gathered to their fathers charles baudelaire from whose sonnet correspondence the symbolists dated baudelaire the precursor of so much modern is to-day chiefly studied in his prose writings critical and aesthetic his little poems in prose are a breviary for the youths who are turning out an amorphous prose which they call free paul verlaine's influence is still marked for he is a maker of debussy like music moonlit vaporish intangible subtle and perverse the very quintessence of poetry haunts the vague terrain of his verse but his ideas his morbidities these are negligible indeed abhorred the new schools whether belonging to the extreme right or extreme left are idealistic in their aim and practice that or nothing the brutalities of zola and the naturalistic school the frigid perfection and metallic impassibility of the parnation are over and done with cynical cinders no longer blind the eye of the ideal there is a renaissance of sensibility the universe is become pluralistic sentimental pantheism is in the air irony has ceased to be a potent weapon in the armory of poets and prosateurs it is replaced by an ardent love of humanity by a socialism that weeps on the shoulder of one's neighbour by a horror of egoism whether masquerading as a philosophy such as nietzsche's or a poesy such as the Parnassian, for these poetlings' issues are cosmical. Coeval, with this revival of sentiment, is a decided leaning toward religion, not the white soul of the Middle Ages, as Huismans would say, not the medieval curiosities of Hugo, Gautier, Lamartine, but the carrying aloft of the banner of belief, 
the opposition to sterile agnosticism by the burning tongues of the Holy Spirit. No dilettante movement this returned to Roman Catholicism. The time came for many of these neophytes when they had to choose at the crossroads, either or. The button moulder was lying in wait for such adolescent peer gint, and, outraged and nauseated by the gross license of their day and hour, by the ostentation of evil instincts, they turned to the right, some, not all of them. The others no longer cry aloud their pagan admiration of the nymph's flesh in the break, of the seven deadly arts and their sister sins. In a word, since 1905, a fresher, a more tonic air has been blowing across the housetops of French art and literature. Science is too positive. Every monad has had its day. Pictorial impressionism is without skeleton. Mysticism is coming into fashion again. Only, the youngsters wear theirs with a difference. Even the cubists are working for formal severity, despite their geometrical fanaticism. Youth will have its fling, and joys in esoteric garb, in flaring colors, and those doors in the narrow streets called perhaps. Do but prove the eternal need of the new and the astounding. Man cannot live on manna alone. He must, to keep from volplaning, to the infinite, go down and gnaw his daily bone. The forked human, radish with the head fantastically carved, has underpinnings also, else his chamber of dreams might overflow into reality, and then we should be converted into a trice to angels, pinfeathers and all. What were the controlling factors in young French literature up to the greatest marking date of modern history, 1914? The philosophy of Henri Bergson is one. That philosophy, full of poetic impulsion, graceful phrasing, and charming evocations. A feminine, nervous, fleshless philosophy, though deriving, as it does, from an intellectual giant, Émile Boutroux. Maurice Barret is another name to conjure with. Once the incarnation of a philosophical and slightly cruel egoism, then the herald of regionalism, replacing the flinty determinism of ten, with the watchwords, patriotism, reverence for the dead, a reverence perilously near ancestor worship, to prose master Barret went into the political arena and became, notwithstanding his rather aggressive modernism, an idealistic reactionary. He is more subtle in his intellectual processes than his one-time master, Paul Bourget, from whom his psychology stemmed, and, if his patriotism occasionally becomes chauvinistic, his sincerity cannot be challenged. That sincerest form of insincerity, moral earnestness, so-called, has never been his. He is no more a sower of sand on the bleak and barren shore of negation. Little wonder he is accepted as a vital teacher. Other names occur as generators of present schools. Stendhal, Malarmé, Georges Rodenbach, Rimbaud, that stepfather of symbolism, Émile Verhagen, who is truly an elemental and disquieting force, Paul Adam, Maternink, the late Rémi de Gourmont, who contributed so much to contemporary thought in the making, Francis Jam, Villiers de Lille Adam, Renard, Samin, Saint-Georges de Beaulieu, Jules Lafargue, and how many others, to be found in the pages of Vance Thompson's French portraits which valuable study dates back to the middle of the roaring nineties. 2. When we are confronted by a litany of strange names, by the intricate polyphony of literary sects and cenacles, the American lover of earlier French poets is bewildered, so swiftly does the whirly gig of time bring new talents. Already the generation of 1900 has jostled from their place the elders of a decade previous. You read of Paul Napoleon Juanard, Maurice Beaubourg, Hans Reiner, a remarkable writer, André Gide, Charles Louis Philippe, of Paul Faure, Paul Claudel, André Suarez, Stéphane Servant, André Spir, Phileas Lebesque, Georges Pauty, whose thirty six dramatic situations deserves an English garb, and you recall some of them as potent creators of values. But if London, a few hours from Paris, only hears of these men through a few critical intermediaries, such as Arthur Simons, Edmund Gosse, and other cultivated and cosmopolitan spirits, 
what may we not say of America, a week away from the scene of action? As a matter of fact, we are proud of our provincialism, and for those who create, as the jargon goes, that same provincialism is a windshield against the drafts of too tempting imitation. But for our criticism, there is no excuse. A critic will never be a Catholic critic of his native literature of art if he doesn't know the literatures and arts of other lands, paradoxal as this may sound. We lack aesthetic curiosity. Because of our uncritical parochialism, America is comparable to a cemetery of clichés. Nevertheless, those of us who went as far as the portraits by Vance Thompson and Amy Lowell must feel a trifle strange in the long, narrow street of Florian Parmentier, with its alternations of septentrional mists and the blazing blue sky of the Midi. This critic, by the way, is a staunch upholder of the Gaul. He will have no admixture of Latin influence. He employs what has jocosely been called the woad argument. He goes back not to the early Britons, but the Celticism. He is a sturdy chimerist and believes not in literatures transalpine or transpyrenean. He loathes the pastiche, the purveyors of canned classics, the chilly rhetoricians who set too much store on conventional learning. A frank, a northerner, on the originator of impulsionism, is Florian Parmentier. In his auscultation of genius, La Psychologie Morale de Poète, 1904, may be found the germs of his doctrine. This doctrine seems familiar enough now, as does the flux of Heraclitus and the becoming of Renan in the teachings of Bergson. Unanimism has had some influence. M. Florian Parmentier does not admire this movement or its prophet, Jules Roman. Unanimism. Ah, the puissant magic of the word for these budding and then, poets the and generation of 1900, it ought to warm the cockles of the heart of critics. Henri Hertz, Sébastien Voirol, Pierre Jodon, Jacques Néral, Fernand Divoire, Tancred Vizin, Strentz, Giraudoux, Mandin, Guillaume Apollinaire. All workers in the vast inane, dwellers on the threshold of the future. The past and present bearings of the Académie Goncourt are carefully indicated. Thus far, nothing extraordinary has come from it. Balzac is still the mighty one in fiction. Thus far, the names of Anatole France, Paul Adam, the brothers Rosny, Pierre Mie, a brilliant, versatile man, still maintain their primacy. Thus far, among the essayists, Rémi de Gourmont, Camille Mauclair, Materlinck, Romain Roland, J. H. Fabre, Jules Bois, now sojourning in America, and a thinker of verve and originality, and Henri Ousset, hold their own against the younger generation. In the theatre there are numerous and vexing tendencies, Materling, loyally acknowledging his indebtedness to gentle Charles von Lerburg, creates a spiritual drama and has disciples, but the theatre is the theatre and resists innovation. Ibsen, who had his day in Paris, and Antoine of the Free Theatre were accepted not because of their novelty, but in spite of it. They both were men of the theatre. There is a school of ideal realism, and there are Curel, Bataille, Porteriche, Materlin, Trarieux, and Marie Lénereux, but the technique of the drama is immutable. In the domain of philosophy and experimental science, we find Émile Boutroux and such collective psychologists as Durkheim, Gustave Le Bon, and Gabriel Tard, names such as Binet, Ribot, Michel Savigny, Alfred Fouillet, and the eminent mathematician Henri Poincaré, who finally became skeptical of his favorite logic, philosophy, and mathematics. This intellectual volteface caused endless discussion. The truth is that intuition, the instinctive versus intellectualism, what William James called vicious intellectualism, is swaying the younger French thinkers and poets. There is, if one is to judge by the anthologies, far too much of metaphysics in contemporary poetry. Poetry is in danger of suffocating in a misty mid-region of metaphysics. The vital impulse, intuitionalism, and rhythmic flow of time in Bergson called the fancy of the poets. Naturally enough, literary dogmatism had prevailed too long in academic centers. Now it is the deliquescence of formal verse that is to be feared. Vers libre, which began with such initiators as that astonishing prodigy, Arthur Rimbaud, has run the gamut from esoteric illuminism to sonorous yawping, from the terrace of the brasserie. Have frogs wings? We are tempted to ask. 
voices they have but not bird-like voices that fascinating philosopher and friend of Rémi de gourmont who practically introduced him must not be overlooked for he had genuine influence i refer to brilliant jules gautier who evolved from flaubert's madame bovary the idea of his bovarism which succinctly stated is the instinct in mankind to appear other than it is from the philosopher to the snob from the priest to the actor from the duchess to the prostitute of the influence of politics upon art and literature which happily are no cloistered virtues in france we need not speak here m florian parmentier does so in his admirable and bulky book of which we have only exposed the highlights since jules huret's enquête sur l'évolution littéraire eighteen ninety followed by similar works of Vélé, jean muller and gaston picard nineteen thirteen we recall no such pamphlet as emile Henriot's mentioned above he put the questions where are we where are we going in le temps of paris june nineteen twelve to a number of representative thinkers and poets and reprinted between covers their answers in nineteen thirteen the result is rather confusing a cloud of contradictory witnesses are assembled and what one affirms the other denies there are no schools yes there are groups we are going to the devil headlong the sky is full of rainbows and the humming of harps celestial better the extravagances of the decayed romanticists than the debasing realism of the modern novel cry the symbolists a plague on all your houses say the unanimists one fierce wolf lou admitted that at the banquets of a cynic he and his fellow poets always aid in effigy the classic writers or was it at the symbolists does it much matter the gesture counts alone with these youthful fumists as les comtes de lille had christened their predecessors Berlin, in his waggish mood persisted in spelling as symbolists the symbolists his own followers gongs would have been a better word a punster speaks of theists as those who love le bon dieu and tea the new critical school at its head Charles Murat, do not conceal their contempt for all these arrivistes and revolutionary groups believing that only a classic renaissance will save young france barnum's the entire lot pronounces in faded accents the ultra-academic group three critics of wide-reaching influence are dead since the war began emile faguet jules lemaitre and Rémi de gourmont they leave no successors worthy of their mettle three the three volumes of anthology of french contemporary poets from eighteen sixty six to nineteen sixteen have been supplemented by a fourth entitled poets of yesterday and today nineteen sixteen edited by the painstaking m g walsh it comprises the verse of poets born as late as eighteen eighty six among the rest is the gifted charles dumas who fell in battle nineteen fourteen as epigraph to the new collection the editor had used a line from this poet's testament ce désir d'être tout que j'appelle mon âme another anthology of the new poets is prefaced by m gustave lanson but the walsh collection reveals more promising talents or else the poems are more representative signor marinetti who is bilingual is eccentrically amusing but are his contortions on the tripod art the auto and aeroplane are celebrated also steam speed mist and the destruction of all art prior to nineteen hundred the new schools are weary of rhetoric thus following paul verdun's injunction take eloquence by the neck and ring it images abound but they are in an aristocratic minority the watchword is sobriety in thinking and expression strangely enough two names emerge victoriously from the confusing lyric symphony and they are those of belgian-born poets emile verhaeren whose tragic death last year was a loss to literature and maurice materling what living lyric poet has the incomparable power of that epical verhaeren unless it be that of the more sophisticated gabriele d'annunzio or the sumptuous decorative verse of henri de Regnier? whose polished art is the antithesis of the exuberant lawless resonant reverberations of verhaeren what thinker and dramatist is known like materling except it be the magical gerard Aptmann? rough to brutality for verhaeren at one time emulated walt whitman variously spelled as wolf and whitman with the names of foreigners paris has ever been careless in his orthography witness litz and edgar poe 
he can boast the divine afflatus. His personality is of the centrifugal order. He has a tumultuous rhythmic undertow that sweeps one irresistibly with him. But his genius is disintegrating rather than constructive. Of what French poet among the younger group dare we say the same? Grace, lyric sweetness, subtlety in ideas, facile technique. All these, yes, but not the power of saying great things greatly. As for Metternich, he owes something to Emerson, but his mellow wisdom and clairvoyance are his own. He is a seer, and his crepuscular pages are pools of glimmering incertitudes, whereas of Verhagen, we may say, as Carlyle said of Landor's prose, the sound of it is like the ring of Roman swords on the helmets of barbarians. Henry James tells a story of an argument between Zola, Flaubert, and Turgenev, the Russian novelist declaring that for him, Chateaubriand was not the ultima tulle of prose perfection. This insensibility to the finer nuances of the language angered and astounded Zola and Flaubert. They set it down to the fact that none but a Frenchman can quite penetrate the inner sanctuary of his own language, which may be true, though I believe that for Turgenev, the author of Atala, was temperamentally distasteful. Therefore, when an American makes the statement that the two Belgians are superior to the living Frenchman, it may be classed as a purely personal judgment. But the proposition first mooted by a distinguished critic, Rémy de Gourmont, that Materling and Verhagen be elected to the French Academy, was not a bizarre one. The war has effaced many artistic frontiers. The majority of the little circles that once pullulated in Paris no longer exist. Both Verhagen and Materling are now Frenchmen of the French. Their inclusion in the Academy would have honoured that venerable and too august body as much as the Belgian poets. As to the war's influence on French letters, that question is for soothsayers to decide, not for the present writer. After 1870, certain psychiatrists pretended that a degeneration of body and soul had blighted artistic and literary Europe. Well, we can only wish for the new France of 1920 and later such a galaxy of talent and genius as the shining groups from 1875 to 1914. No need to finger the chaplet of their names and achievements. Such books as those by Ketchun Mendes, Florian Parmentier, Lanson, and Walsh prove our contention. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of Unicorns This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Unicorns by James Hunnaker Chapter 26 More About Richard Wagner Time was when a fame-craving young man could earn a reputation for originality by merely going to the marketplace and loudly proclaiming his disbelief in a deity. It would seem that modern critics of Richard Wagner, busily engaged in placing the life of the composer under their microscopes, are seeking the laurels of the ambitious chap aforesaid. Never has the music of Wagner been more popular than now. His name on the opera billboards is bound to crowd a house, and never, paradoxically as it may sound, has there been such a critical hue and cry over his works and personality. The publication of his autobiography has much to do with this renewal of interest. There is some praise, much abuse, to be found in the newly published books on the subject. European critics are building up little islands of theory, coral-like, some with fantastic lagoons, Others founded on stern truth, and many doomed to be washed away overnight. Nevertheless, the true Richard Wagner is beginning to emerge from the haze of Nibelheim behind which he contrived to hide his real self. Wagner, the gigantic comedian. Wagner, the egotist. Wagner, the victim of a tragic love. Wagner, tone poet, mock philosopher, and a wonderful apparition in the world of art, till success overtook him. Then Wagner became bored, with no more worlds to conquer, deserted by his best friends, whom he had alienated, without the solace of the men he had most loved, the men who had helped him over the thorny path of his life, Liszt, Nietzsche, von Bülow, Otto Wessendonck, and how many others, even King Ludwig II, whom he had treated with characteristic ingratitude. No, Richard Wagner, during the sterile years, so-called from 1866 to 1883, was not a contented man. 
Despite his union with Cosima von Bülow Liszt and the foundation of a home and family at Bayreuth, one. However, there are exceptions. One is the book of Otto Bournot entitled Ludwig Geyer, the stepfather of Richard Wagner. I wrote about it in 1913 for the New York Times. In this slender volume of only 72 pages, the author sifts all the evidence in the Geyer-Wagner question, and he has delved into archives, into the newspapers of Geyer's days, and has had access to hitherto untouched material. It must be admitted that his conclusions are not to be lightly denied. August Bottiger's necrology has until recently been the chief source of facts in the career of Geyer, but Wagner's autobiography, which in spots Bernat corrects, and the life of Wagner by Mary Burrell, not to mention other books, have furnished Bernat with new weapons. The Geyers, as far back as 1700, were simple pious folk, the first of the family being a certain Benjamin Geyer, who, about 1700, was a trombone player and organist. Indeed, the chief occupation of many Geyers was in some way or other connected with the evangelical church. Ludwig Heinrich Christian Geyer was a portraitist of no mean merit, an actor of considerable power. His Franz Moore was a favorite role with the public, a dramatist of fair ability. He wrote a tragedy, among others, named The Slaughter of the Innocents, and also a verse-maker. His acquaintance with Weber stimulated his interest in music. Weber discovered his voice, and he sang in opera. Truly a versatile man who displayed in miniature all the qualities of Wagner. The latter was too young at the time of Geyer's death, September 1821, to have profited much by the precepts of his stepfather. But his example certainly did prove stimulating to the imagination of the budding poet and composer. Geyer married Joanna Wagner Burtz, Mary Burrell was the first to give the correct spelling of her maiden name. The widow of the police functionary Wagner, to whose memory Richard pays such cynical homage in his obituary, August 14, 1814. She had about 261,008 children. A ninth came later in the person of Cecile, who afterward married a member of the Avenarius family. Cecile, or Sicily, was a prime favorite with Richard. Seven years passed, and again Frau Geyer found herself a widow, with nine children and little money. How the family all tumbled up in the world, owing much to the courage, wit, vivacity, and unshaken willpower of their mother, may be found in the autobiography. Bernat admits that Geyer and his wife may have carried to the grave certain secrets. Richard Wagner, until he was nine years old, was known as Richard Geyer, and on page 13 of his book, our author prints the following significant sentence, quote, The possibility of Wagner's descent from Geyer contains in itself nothing detrimental to our judgment of the artwork of Bayreuth, unquote. Two. In 1900, a 20-page pamphlet bearing the title Richard Wagner in Zurich was published in Leipzig. It was signed Hans Bellart and gave for the first time to a much mystified world the story of Wagner's passion for Matilda Wessendonck, thus shattering beyond hope of repair our cherished belief that Cosima von Bülow Liszt had been the lodestone of Wagner's desire, that to her influence was due the creation of Tristan and Isolde, its composer's high watermark in poetic, dramatic music. Now, Bellart, not content with his iconoclastic pamphlet, has just set forth a fat book which he calls Richard Wagner's Love Tragedy with Matilda Wessendonck. We had thought that the last word in the matter had been said when Bayreuth, Queen Cosima I, allowed the publication of Wagner's diaries and love letters to Matilda, though her complete correspondence is as yet unpublished. But Bellart is one of the busiest among the German critical choral builders. He has dug into musty newspapers and letters, and gives, at the close of his work, a long list of authorities. Yet nothing startling new comes out of his researches. We knew that Matilda Wessendonck, was the first love of Wagner, a genuine and noble passion, not his usual self-seeking philandering. We also know that Otto Wessendonck behaved like a patient husband and a gentleman. Any other man would have put a bullet in the body that thrice impertinent genius knew, too, that Tristan and Isolde was born of this romance. But there is a mass of fresh details, petty backstairs gossip, all the tittle-tattle beloved of such writers, that in company with Julius Capps Wagner, Undi Freud, 
makes Belzart's new book a valuable one for reference. Cap, who has written a life of Franz Liszt, goes Belzart one better, in hinting that the infatuated couple transformed their idealism into realism. Belzart does not believe this. Neither does Emil Ludwig, the latest critical commentator on Wagner. But neither critic gives the profoundest proof that the love of Richard and Matilda was an exalted platonic one, that is, the proof physiologic. I firmly believe that if Matilda Westendonk had eloped with Wagner in 1858, as he begged her to do, Tristan and Isolde might not have been finished. At all events, the third act would not have been what it is now. A mighty longing is better for the birth of great art than facile happiness. For the first time in his selfish, unhappy life, Wagner realized Goethe's words of wisdom, Renounce thou shalt, shalt renounce. It was a bitter sacrifice, but out of its bitterness sweetness came the honey and moonlight of Tristan and Isolde. Wagner suffered, Matilda suffered, Otto Wessendonck suffered, and last, but not least, men of Wagner, the poor pawn in his married game, suffered to distraction. Let us begin with a quotation on the last page, but three, of Bell Art's book. Quote, Remarked Otto Wessendonck to a friend, I have hunted Wagner from my threshold. Unquote. This was in August 1858. Wagner first met the Wessendonks about 1852, three years after he had fled to Zurich from Dresden because of his participation in the uprising of 1849, Wagner as amateur revolutionist. Thanks to the request of his wife Matilda, Otto Wessendonck furnished a little house on the hill near his splendid villa for the Wagners. First christened Fafner Repose, Wagner changed the title to the Isle, and for a time it was truly an asylum for this perturbed spirit. But he must needs fall deeply in love with his charming and beautiful neighbor, a woman of intellectual and poetic gifts, and to the chagrin of her husband and of Wagner's faithful wife. The gossip in the neighborhood was considerable, for the complete frankness of the infatuated ones was not the least curious part of the affair. Litz knew of it. So did the Princess Lane Wittgenstein. An immense amount of snooping was indulged in by interested lady friends of men of Wagner. She has her apologists, and, judging from the letters she wrote at the time and afterward, several printed for the first time by Knapp and Bellart, she took a lively hand in the general proceedings. Evidently, she was tired of her good man's behavior, and when he solemnly assured her that it was the master passion of his life, she didn't believe him. Naturally not. He had cried wolf too often. Besides, Minna, like a practical person, viewed the possibility of a rupture with Otto Wessendonck as a distinct misfortune. Otto had not only advanced much money to Richard, but he paid 12,000 francs for the scores of Reinhold and Valkyr and for the complete performing rights. Afterward, he sent both to King Ludwig II as a gift, but I doubt if he ever got a penny from his tenants for rent. He also defrayed the expenses of the Wagner concert at Zurich, a little item of 9,000 francs. Scandal and calumny invaded his home. The fair fame of his wife was threatened. No wonder the finale, long deferred, was stormy, even operatic. The lady was much younger than her husband. She was born at the close of 1828, therefore Wagner's junior by 15 years. She was a Lukmeyer, her mother a Stein, a cultured, sweet-natured woman. It is more than doubtful if she could have endured Wagner as a husband. She did a wise thing in resisting his prayers. Not only was her husband a bar to such a proceeding, but her children would have always prevented her thinking of a legal separation. All sorts of plans were in the air. When, in 1857, the American panic seriously threatened the prosperity of Otto Wessendonck, who had heavy business interests in New York, gossip averred that Frau Wessendonck would ask for a divorce. But the air cleared and matters resumed their old aspect. Men of Wagner's health, always poor, became worse. It was a case of exasperated nerves made worse by drugs. She daily made scenes at home and threatened to tell what she knew. That she knew much is evident from her correspondence with Frau Wilk. She said that Wagner had two hearts, but while he delighted in intellectual and emotional friendship with such a superior soul as Matilda, he nevertheless would not forego the domestic comforts provided by Mena. Like many another genius, Wagner was bourgeois. Those intolerable dogs, the parrot, 
the coffee drinking, the soft beds and solicitude about his underclothing, all were truly German, human, all too human. In September 1857, the newly married von Bülow's paid the Wagners a visit, and as the guest chamber of the cottage was occupied, they took up temporary quarters in an inn, the Raven, Wotan's Ravens. Cosima, young, impressionable, turned her face to the wall and wept when Wagner played and sang for his friends the first and second acts of Siegfried. Even then she felt the pull of his magnetism, of his genius, and doubtless regretted having married the fussy, irritable von Bülow, who had gone down in the social scale in wedding a girl of dubious descent. In Paris, Liszt, for many years, was only a strolling gypsy piano player to whom the Countess de Gaulle had condescended. Matilda Wessendonck entertained the von Bülows, who went away pleased with their reception. Above all, deeply impressed by the exiled Wagner, they so reported to Liszt, and von Bülow did more. As the scion of an old aristocratic family, he made many attempts to secure an amnesty for Wagner, as well as making propaganda for his music, which favors Wagner, who was the very genius of ingratitude repaid later. In one point, Herr Ludwig is absolutely correct. The composer was supported by his friends from 1849 to the year when King Ludwig intervened. The starvation talk was a part of the Wagner legend. Even the Paris days were greatly exaggerated as to their black poverty. Wagner was always a spendthrift. From November 1857 to May 1858, Wagner set to music the five poems of Matilda, veritable sketches for, for Tristan. Early in September 1857, the relations between Minna and Matilda had become strained. Wagner accused his wife of abusing Matilda in a vulgar manner. Worse remained, he had sent a letter by the gardener to Frau Wessendonck, and the jealous wife intercepted it, broke the seal, read the contents. To Wagner, this was the blackest of crimes. Yet can you blame her? To be sure, she had no conception of her husband's genius. For her, Reinze was his only work. Had it not succeeded, so had Tannenhauser and Lohengrin, also the Flying Dutchman. But Renzi was her darling. How often she begged him to write another opera of the same Wagnerian caliber. He has not failed to tell us. Otto Wessendonck's wife, she firmly believed, was leading him into a quagmire. What theater could ever produce the ring? One thing, however, Minna did not do. As most writers on the subject say she did, she did not show the fatal letter to Wessendonck at the time, only to Wagner. Later, she made its meaning clear to the injured husband, which no doubt provoked the explosive phrase quoted above. The youthful Karl Tossig, bearing credentials from Liszt, appeared on the scene in May 1858, and the entire household was soon in an uproar. Luckily, Wagner had persuaded Mena to take a cold-water cure at a sanatorium some distance from Zurich, so he could handle the wild-eyed Tossig, whose volcanic piano performances at the age of sixteen made the mature composer both wonder and admire. Tossig smoked black cigars, a trait he imitated from Liszt, and almost lived on coffee. Here is a curious criticism of him made by Cosina von Bülow, who, it must be remembered, was both the daughter and wife of famous pianist. She said, quote, Tossic has no touch, no individuality. He is a caricature of Litz, unquote. This, in the light of Tossic's subsequent artistic career, sounds almost comical. It also shows the intensely one-sided temperament of a remarkable woman who banished from her life both von Bülow and her father, Franz Liszt, when Wagner entered into her dreams. The fortitude she displayed after her Richard's death in 1883 was not tempered by any human feeling toward her father. His telegrams were unanswered. She denied herself to him. She became a Brunhild frozen into a symbol of intolerable grief. Of her personal fascination, the sister of Nietzsche, Elizabeth Forrester Nietzsche, told me, when I last saw her at Weimar, von Bülow succumbed to this charm. Rubinstein also. Query, perhaps that is the reason he so savagely abused Wagner in his conversations on music? And if gossip doesn't die, Nietzsche was another victim. On September 17, 1858, after a general row, Wagner left his home on the Green Hill, his isle, forever. Why? Plenty of conjectures, no definite statements. 
He makes a great show of frankness in his diaries, in his autobiography, but they were obviously edited by Bearruth. Tristan and Isolde remains as evidence that a mighty emotion had transfigured the nature of a genius, and, instead of an erotic anecdote, the world of art is richer in the possession of a moving drama of desire and woe and tragedy. At the Berlin premiere of Tristan, the old Kaiser Wilhelm remarked, How Wagner must have loved when he wrote the work, which is sound psychology. 3. The two books discussed are constructive in nature. Not so the book of Emil Ludwig, Wagner, or The Disenchanted, which is frankly destructive. Since the Wagner case by Nietzsche, and not Nietzsche at his best, there has not been written a book so overflowing with hatred for Wagner, the man as well as the musician. Ludwig is the author of poems, plays, and a study of Bismarck, the latter a noteworthy achievement. He is thorough in his attacks, though he does not measure up to Ernest Newman in his analysis of Wagner's poetry, libretti, and philosophy. The English critic's studies remain the best of its kind because it is written without part of pre. Ludwig slash a la Nietzsche, though he cannot boast that poet's diamantine style. He accuses Wagner of being paroxysmal, erotic, a painter of moods. He couldn't build a Greek temple like Beethoven, weak as a poet, inconclusive as a musician. For Tristan and de Meistersinger, he has words of hearty praise. The Ludwig book stirred up a nest of hornets, and one lawsuit it resulted. A newspaper critic presumed to criticize, and the sensitive poet, who called Wagner every bad name in the Schmimpf lexicon, invoked the aid of the law. We know only too well, thanks to that ill-tasting but engrossing autobiography, that Wagner was a monster of ingratitude. Hasn't Nietzsche, against his own natural feeling, proclaimed the futility of gratitude? Perhaps he learned this lesson from his hard experience with Wagner. We also know that Wagner wanted to run the universe, but after a brief note from Ludwig II, he left Munich rather than face the angry burghers. He attempted to coerce Bismarck, but there he ran up against a wall of granite. Bismarck was a Beethoven lover, and he abhorred, as did von Bost, revolutionists. Thereat, Wagner wrote sarcastic things about the uselessness and vanity of statesmen. He didn't treat Ludwig II right when he announced from Venice that he wasn't in sufficient health and spirits to grant the king's request for a performance of the Prelude to Lohengrin in a darkened theater with one listener, Ludwig II. Uh, by the way, Ludwig II never sat through a performance alone of Parsifal. Once and once only, Years before the completion of the work, he heard a performance of the prelude in Munich given for his sole benefit. Wagner's gruff letter wounded the sensitive idealist. In 1866, a few weeks after the death of Minna Wagner Planner, Cosima von Bülow Liszt followed Wagner to Switzerland. Probably the hostile attitude of Liszt in the affair was largely inspired by the fact that, when Richard and Cosima married, the latter abjured Catholicism and became a Protestant. Litz, a religious man, despite his pyrotechnical virtuosity in the luxurious region of sentiment, never could reconcile himself to this defection on the part of a beloved child. It angered Nietzsche to discover in Wagner a leaning toward mysticism, toward religion. Witness the muck mysticism and burlesque of religious ritual in Parsifal. After Frauerbach came Arthur Schopenhauer in the intellectual life of Wagner. This was in 1854. His friend Willie lent him the book. Immediately he started to Schopenhauerize the ring, thereby making a hopeless muddle of situation and character. The enormous vitality of Wagner's temperament expressed itself in essentially optimistic terms. He was not a pessimist, and he hopelessly misunderstood his new master. Wotan must needs become a Schopenhauerian and Siegfried a pessimist at the close. Nietzsche was right. Schopenhauer proved a powerful poison for Wagner, and Schopenhauer himself laughed at Wagner's music. He remained true to Rossini and Mozart and advised Wagner, through a friend, to stick to the theater and hang his music on a nail in the wall. But when his library was overhauled, several marginalia were discovered. One, which he contemptuously wrote on a verse of Wagner's, Ear, ear, where are your ears, musician? Wagner, when Liszt abjured him to turn to religion as a consolation, replied, I believe only in mankind. Ludwig compares this declaration with some of the latter opinions concerning Christianity, 
of which Wagner has said many evil things. Wagner's life was a series of concessions to the inevitable. He modified his art theories as he grew older, and with fame and riches, his character deteriorated. He couldn't stand success. He, the bravest man of his day, the undaunted fighter for an idea, crooked the knee to cast, became an amateur mystic, and announced his intention of returning to absolute music, of writing a symphony strict in form, which for his reputation he luckily did not attempt. He was a colossal actor and the best self-advisor the world has yet known since Nero. But I can't understand Herr Ludwig when he asserts that from 1866 to 1883, the composer did nothing but compose two marches, finished Siegfried and Gotterdammerung. Rather a large order, considering the labors of the man as practical opera conductor, prose writer, poet, dramatist, and composer, and then, too, the gigantic scheme of Bayreuth was realized in 1876. Comparatively barren would be a fairer phrase. After Tristan and Isolde, what could any man compose? A work which its creator rightfully said was a miracle he couldn't understand. After the antidotage of Wagner's career is forgotten, after Bayreuth has become owl-haunted, Tristan and Isolde will be listened to by men and women who love or have been loved. It isn't pleasant to read a book like Ludwig's, truthful as it may be in parts, nor should he call our attention to the posthumous venom of the composer as expressed in his hateful remarks concerning Otto Wessendonck. There, Wagner was his own meme, his own Albrecht, not the knightly hero who would not woo the fair Irish maid till magic did melt his will. Richard Wagner was once Tristan. End of chapter 26「Chapter twenty seven of Unicorns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Unicorns by James Hunnaker. Chapter twenty seven. My first musical adventure music mad i arrived in paris during the last weeks of the world's fair of eighteen seventy eight impelled there by a parching desire to see franz liszt if not to hear him he was then honorary director of the austro-hungarian section but i could not find him although i heard of him everywhere of musical fetes and the usual glittering company that had always surrounded this extraordinary son of fortune one day i fancied i saw him i was sadly walking the rue de rivoli of an october afternoon when in a passing carriage i saw an old chap with bushy white hair his face full of expressive warts and in his mouth a long black cigar which he was furiously puffing list i gasped and started in pursuit it was not an easy job to keep up with the carriage at last because of a blocked procession i caught up and took a long stare the object of which composedly smiled at me but did not truly convince me that he was franz liszt you see there were so many different pictures of him even the warts were not always the same in number when i am in the cambyses vein i swear i have seen liszt perhaps i did liszt or no liszt my ambition was fired and at the advice of frederick boscovitz a pupil of liszt and cousin of raphael Josephi, i went to the conservatoire national with a letter of introduction to the acting secretary emile Reti i was told that i was too old to enter being a few months past eighteen i was disappointed and voiced my woes to lucy hamilton hooper then a clever writer and correspondent of several american newspapers her husband was vice-consul robert hooper and he kindly introduced me to general fairchild the consul and after a cross-examination i was given a letter 
in which the united states government testified to my good social standing i was not a bandit nor yet an absconder from justice and extreme youth armed with this formidable document i again besieged the gates of the great french conservatoire whose tuition it must be remembered is free i was successful inasmuch as i was permitted to present myself at the yearly examination which took place november thirteenth ominous date to say that i studied hard and shook in my boots is a literal statement i lived at the time in an alley-like street off the boulevard des batignons and lived luxuriously on five dollars a week eating one satisfying meal a day with a hot bowl of coffee in the morning and practising on a wretched little cottage piano as long as my neighbours would stand the noise they chucked boots or any old faggot they could find at my door and after twelve hours i was so tired of patrolling the keyboard that i was glad to stop then a pillow on my stomach to keep down the pangs of a youthfully gorgeous appetite i would lie in bed till dinner-time oh chopin oh consomme and boiled beef oh sour blue wine at six cents the litre at last the fatal day dawned as the novelists say it was nasty chilling foggy autumnal but my long locks hung negligently and my velveteen coat was worn defiantly open to the wind i reached the conservatoire then in the old building on the rue de faubourg Soignier, at precisely nine o'clock of the morn i was put in a large room with an indiscriminate lot of candidates some of them so young as to be fit for the care of a nurse like lost sheep we huddled and as my eyes feverishly rambled i noticed a lad of about twelve with curling hair worn artist fashion a naughty haughty boy he was for he sneered at my lengthy legs and audibly inquired is grandpa to play with us i knew enough french to hate that little monster with a nervous hatred there was a tightened feeling about my throat and heart and i waited in an agitated spirit for my number a bearded and shy young man came in from examination and was at once mocked by the incipient virtuoso in pantalettes another unfortunate with a roll of music then the little devil was summoned we sat up in ten minutes he returned with downcast mien flushed face tears in his eyes and tried to sneak out of the room but too late after shaking hands all round we solemnly danced in a circle about the now sobbing and no longer sinister child who says youth is ever generous number thirteen sang out a voice and i was pushed through a narrow entry and a minute later was standing on the historic stage of the paris conservatoire the lighting was dim but i discerned a group of persons somewhere in front of me a man asked me to sit down at the grand piano of course like most pianos out of tune and i tremblingly obeyed his polite request at this juncture a woman's voice inquired how old are you monsieur i told her a feminine laugh rippled through the gloom for i wore a fluffy little beard was undeniably gawky and looked conspicuously older than my years that laugh settled me queer creepy feelings seized my legs my eyes were full of solar spectrums my throat a furnace and my heart beat like a trip-hammer i was not the first man young or old to be knocked out by a woman's laugh later i met the lady she was madame massard and the wife of the well-known violin master massard of the conservatoire again the demand play something it was a foregone conclusion but i couldn't i began a minuetto from a beethoven sonata hesitated saw fiery snakes and a kaleidoscope of comets 
then pitched into a presto by the unfortunate beethoven and was soon stopped a sheet of manuscript was placed before me i could have sworn that it was upside down so was a sight reading test it was a failure i was altogether a distinguished failure and with the audible comment of the examining faculty ringing in my ears i stumbled across the stage into welcome darkness and without waiting to thank secretary Reti for his amiability i got away crossing in a hurry that celebrated courtyard in which the hideous noises made by many instruments including the human voice reminded me of a torture circle in dante's inferno the united states had no reason to be proud of her musical or unmusical son that dull day in november eighteen seventy eight when i arrived in my garret i swore i was through and seriously thought of studying the xylophone but my mood of profound discouragement was succeeded by a more hopeful one if you can't enter the paris conservatoire as an active student you may have influence enough to become an auditeur a listener and a listener i became and in the class of professor georges matthias a genuine pupil of chopin my musical readers will understand my good luck from that spiritual master i learned many things about the polish composer heard from his still supple fingers much music as chopin had interpreted it delicate and discriminating in style m mattia had never developed into a brilliant concert pianist sometimes he produced effects on the keyboard that sounded like emotional porcelain falling from a high shelf and melodiously shattering on velvet mirrors he also taught me that if a pianist or violinist or singer is too nervous before the public then he or she has not a musical vocation the case of adolf henselt to the contrary notwithstanding but better would it be for me to admit that i failed because i didn't will earnestly enough to succeed End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of unicorns this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org unicorns by james hunnaker chapter twenty eight violinists now and yesteryear with the hair of the horse and the entrails of the cat magicians of the four strings weave their potent spells what other instrument devised by the hand of man has ever approached the violin gladstone compared it with the locomotive yet complete as is the mechanism of the wheeled monster its type is transitional steam is already supplanted by electricity while the violin is perfection as perfect as a sonnet and in its capacity for the expression of emotion next to the human voice indeed it is even more poignant orchestrally massed it can be as terribly beautiful as an army with banners in quartet form it represents the very soul of music it is both sensuous and intellectual the modern grand pianoforte with its great range its opulence of tone its delicacy of mechanism is nevertheless a monster of music if placed beside the violin with its simple curves its almost primitive method of music-making the scraping of one substance against another goes back to prehistoric times nay may be seen in the grasshopper and its ingenious manner of producing sound but the violin as we know it to-day is not such an old invention it was the middle of the sixteenth century before it made its appearance with its varnished and mottled back restricted as is its range of dynamics the violin has had for its votaries men of such widely differing temperaments as paganini and spohr wilhelma and sarasate joachim and isai its literature does not compare with that of the piano for which bach beethoven schumann chopin and brahms have written their choicest music 
Yet the intimate nature of the violin, its capacity for passionate emotion, crowns it, and not the organ with its mechanical tonal effects, as the king of instruments. Nor does the voice make the peculiar appeal of the violin. Its lowest note is the G below the treble clef, and its top note a mere squeak, but it seems in a few octaves to have imprisoned within its wooden walls a miniature world of feeling. Even in the hands of a clumsy amateur it has the formidable power of giving pain, while in the grasp of a master it is capable of arousing the soul. No other instrument has the ecstatic quality neither the shallow-toned pianoforte nor the more mellow and sonorous violoncello. The angelic, demoniacal, lovely, intense tones of the violin are without parallel in music or nature. It is as if this box with four strings across its varnished belly had a rarer nervous system than all other instruments. It is a cry, a shriek, a hymn to heaven, a call to arms, an exquisite evocation, a brilliant series of multicolored visions, a broad song of passion, or mocking laughter. What cannot the violin express if the soul that guides it be that of an artist? Otherwise it is only a fiddle. It is the hero, the heroine, the vanguard of every composition. As a solo instrument in a concerto, its still small voice is heard above the din and thunder of the accompaniment. In a word, this tiny music box is the ruler among instruments. Times have changed since 1658 in England, when the following delightful ordinance was made for the benefit of musical genius or otherwise. And be it enacted that if any person or persons, commonly called fiddlers or minstrels, shall at any time after the said first of July be taken playing, fiddling, or making music in any inn, alehouse, or tavern, or shall be proffering themselves, or desiring, or entreating any person or persons to hear them play, shall be adjudged rogues, vagabonds, and sturdy beggars. Decidedly, England was not then the abode of the muses, for the poor actor suffered in company with the musician. You wonder whether this same penalty would be imposed upon musical managers. They certainly do entreat the public to listen to their fiddlers. Yet in 1690, when Corelli, the father of violin playing, led the band at Cardinal Ottoboni's house in Rome, he stopped the music because his churchly patron was talking, and he made an epigram that has since served for other artists. Monsignor, remarked this intrepid musician, when asked why the band had ceased, I fear the music might interrupt the conversation. How well Liszt knew this anecdote may be recalled by his retort to a czar of Russia under similar circumstances. Until a few months ago, I had not heard Eugene Issey play for years. In the old days, he had enchanted my ears, and in company with Girardi, the violoncellist, and Pugno, the pianist, had made music fit for the gods. Considering the flight of the years, I found the art of the Belgian comparatively untouched. Like Liszt, like Paderewski, Issey has his good moments and his indifferent. He is the Paderewski of the strings in his magical interpretations, and unlike his younger contemporaries, he still carves out the whole block of the great classics, sonatas, and concertos. He plays little things tenderly, exquisitely, and the man is first the musician, then the virtuoso. I heard neither Paganini nor Spohr. Joachim, Wilhelmi, Wienowski, and Issei I have heard and seen. My memory assures me of keener satisfactions than any book about these giants of the four strings could give me. The first violinist I ever listened to was in the early seventies. I was hardly at the age of musical discrimination. Yet I remember much. It was at the opera, a matinee in the Philadelphia Academy of Music. 
Nilsson was singing. I can't recall her on that occasion, though it seems only the other day when Carlotta Potty sang the Queen of the Night in the Magic Flute and limped over the stage. Possibly the lameness fixed the event in my mind more than the music. A front set was dropped between the acts at this particular matinee. I do not recollect the name of the opera, and through a practicable door came an old gentleman with a violin in his hands. He was white-haired, he wore white side-whiskers, and he looked to my young eyes like a prosperous banker. He played. It was as the sound of falling waters on a moonlight night. I asked the name of the old gentleman. My father said, Henri Vieuxtemps, which told me nothing then, though it means much to me now. What did he play? I do not know. Yet whenever I hear the younger men attack his fantasy caprice, his ballade in Polonaise, his concertos, I think proudly, I have heard Vieuxtemps. He was a Belgian, born 1820, died 1881. His style was finished, elegant, charming. He was a pupil of de Barrio and represented with his master perfection in the Belgian school. After an interval of some years, I heard the only pupil of Paganini, as he called himself, Camille Sivori. It was in Paris, 1879. The precise day I can't say, but my letter from Paris, which appeared in the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin, was dated January 31, 1879. I still preserve it in a venerable scrapbook. I was in my teens, but I wrote with the courage of youthful ignorance, as follows. It almost sounds like a musical criticism. Although it was generally supposed that Sivuri, the great violinist, would not play this season in Paris, he nevertheless delighted a large audience last Sunday at the Concert Populaire with his lovely music. He is no longer a young man, but the vigor and fire of his playing are immense. He gave, with the orchestral accompaniment, a Bersus, his own composition, with unapproachable delicacy. It was played throughout with the mute. In contrast came a mouvement perpetuel. Sivori's tone is not like that of Joachim or Wilhelma, but it is sweeter than either. It reminds one of gold drawn to cobweb fineness. As an encore, he played the too well-known Carnival of Venice. That it was given in the style of his illustrious master, Paganini, who may say? But it was amazing, painful, finally tiresome. That same season I heard Anna Bach, Boscovitz, Diemer, Plant, Theodore Ritter, the two jails, Fat Alfred and his thin wife. Savori, 1815-1894. Dapper, modest, stood up in the vast spaces of the Cirque du Ver, which was engaged every Sunday by Jacques Padelou and his orchestra. Jacob Wolfgang was the real name of this conductor, who braved the wrath of his audiences by putting Wagner on his programs. And one afternoon, we had a pitched battle over Rimsky-Korsakov's symphonic poem, Sadka. Savuri played a tarantella. Every tone was clearly heard in the great, crowded auditorium. Pupils of de Barrio and Paganini I have heard, though I hardly recall the style of the former and nothing of the latter but there was little of Paganini's fiery attack in Savuri. Possibly he was too old. Fire and fury I later found in Vianowski. I must not omit the name of Ola Boule, 1810-1880, for, though I heard him as a boy, I best remember him in 1880, when he gave his last concerts in America. In the fifties, while on a visit to my father's house, he went on his two thumbs around a dining table, lifting his body clear from the ground. His muscular power was remarkable. It showed in the dynamics of his robust and sentimental playing. Spore discouraged him as a boy, 
but later spoke of his wonderful playing and sureness of his left hand. Unfortunately, like Paganini, he sacrifices what is artistic to something that is not quite suitable to the noble instrument. His tone, too, is bad. For Spore, anyone's tone was naturally enough bad, as he possessed the most monumental tone that ever came from a violin. The truth is that Ole Bull was not a classical player. As I remember him, he could not play in strict tempo. Like Chopin, he indulged in the rubato and abused the portamento. But he knew his public. America a half-century ago, particularly in the regions he visited, was not in the mood for sonatas or concertos. Old Dan Tucker and the Arkansas Traveler were the mode. Boole played them both, played jigs and old tunes, roused the echoes with a star-spangled banner and Irish melodies. He played such things beautifully, and it would have been musical snobbery to say that you didn't like them. You couldn't help yourself. The grand old fellow bewitched you. He was a handsome Merlin, with a touch of the charlatan and a touch of list in his tall, willowy figure, small waist, and heavy head of hair. Such white hair! It tumbled in masses about his kindly face, like one of his native Norwegian cataracts. He was the most picturesque old man I ever saw, except Walt Whitman, at that time a steady attendant of the Carl Gardner String Quartet concerts in Philadelphia. And what Walt didn't know about music, he made up in his love for stray dogs. He was seldom without canine company. Those were the days when Prima's La Melancholy and Vianowski's La Jeanne were the two favorite yet remote peaks of the students' repertoire. How we loved them! Then came Vianowski with Rubinstein in 1872-1873, and such violin-playing America had never before heard, nor has it since, let me hasten to add. This Pole, 1835-1880, was a brilliant master. His dash and fire and pathos carried you off your feet. His tone at times was like molten metal. He had a caressing and martial bow. His technique was infallible, his temperament truly Slavic, languorous, subtle, fierce. Vianowski always reminded me of a red-hot coal. How chivalric is his Polonaise, that old war-horse! How elegiac his legende! His favorite pupil was Leopold Lichtenberg, the greatest violin talent that has been thus far unearthed in America. Lichtenberg had everything when a youth temperament, brains, musical feeling, and great technical ability. After Wienowski followed Wilhelma, who did not efface his memory, but plunged one into another atmosphere, that of the calm, profound, untroubled, and classic. No doubt Spohr's tone was larger, yet this is difficult to believe. Wilhelma drew from his instrument the noblest sounds I ever heard, not Joachim, not Ise, excelled him in cantabile. He was the first to play Wagner transcriptions. No wonder Wagner made him leader of the strings at Beirut in 1876. How he read the Beethoven Concerto, the Bach Chacon, or the D-flat Nocturne of Chopin, in D, or the much-abused Mendelssohn E minor Concerto, with Max Vogrich accompanying him at the piano. A giant in physique. When he faced his audience, there was something of the majestic fair haired god Wotan in his immobile posture. He never appealed to his public as did Wienowski. There was always something of chilly grandeur and remoteness in Wilhelma's play. The last time I saw him was at Marienbad, shortly before his death, where a stoop shouldered, gray haired old man. He was taking a cure. He walked slowly, his hands clasped behind him, in his eyes the vacant look of one busy with memories. He reminded me of Beethoven's pictures. Josef Joachim, that mighty Hungarian, was past his prime when I heard him in London. He played out of tune, 
Some of his pupils have imitated his failing, but whether in a Beethoven quartet, concerto, sonata with piano, he always stamped on your consciousness that Joseph Joachim was the greatest violinist that had ever lived. This is, of course, absurd, this unfair comparison of one artist with another. Yet it is human to compare, and if a violinist can evoke such a vision of perfection, then he must be of uncommon powers. Maud Powell, a distinguished pupil of Joachim, has asserted that it took her three years before she could recover herself in the presence of Joachim's overwhelming personality. Yet he struck me as not at all assertive. He seemed an objective player, i.e., you thought only of Beethoven, of Brahms, as he calmly delivered himself of their Olympian measures. The grand manner is now out of fashion. We care more for exotic rhetoric than for simple and lofty measures. Sarasate and Dengremont charmed me more. Vianowski set my blood coursing faster. But in Joachim's presence, I felt as if near some old Grecian temple hallowed by the presence of oft-worshipped gods. Remigny was a puzzle. He could play divinely and scratch diabolically. He belonged to that old romantic school in which pose and gesture, contortion and grimace occupied a prominent place. I had an opportunity to study Remigny, whose Austrian name was Hoffman, 1830-1898, at close quarters. He brought to my father's house, in the early 80s, his favorite instruments, and such a wild night of music I never heard. He played hour after hour, everything from Bach to Brahms, and incidentally scolded Brahms for stealing some of his, Remigny's, Hungarian dances, which is a joke, as Brahms only followed the examples of Liszt and Joachim in avowedly employing Hungarian folk melodies. He did such tricks as dashing off in impeccable tune his arrangement of the D-flat valse of Chopin in double notes at a terrific tempo. Violinists will understand the feat when I tell them that the key was the original one, D-flat. He made the walls shiver when he struck his bow clangorously in the opening chords of the Rakotsi march. What a hero then seemed this stout little prancing bald-headed man with the face of an unfrocked priest. How he could talk in a half-dozen different languages. He had traveled enough and encountered enough celebrated people to fill a dozen volumes with his recollections. He was a violinist of unquestionable power. That he deteriorated in his later years was to have been expected. Liszt understood and appreciated Remigny from the first. He nicknamed him the Kossuth of the Fiddle. To recall all the celebrities of the violin I have heard since 1870 would be hardly possible. I've forgotten most of them, though I do remember that wonderful boy, Maurice d'Engremont, who ended his life so rich in possibilities, it is said as a billiard marker. He was spoiled by women, for he was a comely lad. Another wonder child kept his head, and today fascinating Fritz Kreisler is a master of masters, and a favorite in America without peer. He first appeared at Boston, and in 1888. In Paris, I recall Marsic and his polished style. The gallant Sauré, Johannes Wolff, and the brilliant and elegant Timothy Adamowski and in 1880, Marie Theo and her woman quartet, a member of which was Jean Franco, the sister of the conductors and violinists, Sam Franco and Nahan Franco, Cesar Thompson, the miraculous, C.M. Leffler, subtle player, subtle composer, Sarasate with his sweet tone, Brodsky and his masculine manner, Willie Burmester and his pallid pyrotechnics, the learned Shradiak, the bohemian Andrzejczyk, the dashing Ovida Musan, Bernhard Listerman, Karl Hollier, Gregorowicz, the languid, brilliant Marteau, Alexander Pechinikov, the Russian, the musicianly Max Bendix, the astonishing John Rhodes, 
the wonder worker Kubelik and his icy perfections. Koshian, Willie Hess, Ephraim Zimbalist, Albert Spaulding, Arthur Hartman, and a myriad of spoiled youths. Von Vexi, Horsowski, all have crossed the map of my memory, and Franz Niesel and the Niesel Quartet, dispensers of musical joys for decades, but alas, no more, alas. I would not barter memories of their music-making for a wilderness of virtuosi. I must not forget Joseph White, the Cuban violinist, who was with Theodore Thomas one season. His style was finished and Parisian. He was a mulatto and a handsome man. The night I heard him, he played the Mendelssohn Concerto, and at the beginning of the slow movement, his chanterelle broke. Calmly he took concertmaster Richard Arnold's proffered instrument and triumphantly finished the composition. Three violinists abide clear in my recollection, Wienowski, Wilhelma, and Ise. The last named is dearer because nearer, contrary to the supposed rule that the older the thing, the worse it is. Ise is the magician of the violin. He holds us in a spell with that elastic curving bow of his, with those many-colored tones, tender, silky, sardonic, amorous, rich, and ductile. He interprets the classics as well as the romantics, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, Viotom as well as Sibelius. Above all else, his mastery of the violin's technical mysteries looms his musical temperament. He has imagination. I have reserved the women for the last, a goodly artistic company. It is not necessary to go back to the Milanola sisters. We still cherish remembrances of Camilla Urso and her broad musicianly manner, the finished style of Norman Neruda, Maris Soldat, the gifted and unhappy Arma Senkra, Nettie Carpenter, Teresina Tua, who did not become a fiddle fairy when she visited us in 1887, Leonora Jackson, Dora Becker, Olive Mead, and Maud Powell, in Europe many years ago, I heard Marcella Sembrick, who, after playing the E-flat polonaise of Chopin on the piano, picked up a violin and dashed off the Wienowski polonaise. These feats were followed by songs, one being Viardo Garcia's arrangement of Chopin's D major mazurka. Sembrick is the blue rose among great singers. Garica, Power, Nikish were at first violinists. So was Fritz Scheel, late conductor of the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra. Franz Niesel is a conductor of great skill. So is Frederick Stock, who followed Theodore Thomas as conductor of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Theodore Spearing, formerly concertmaster of the Philharmonic Orchestra, proved himself an excellent conductor. But that a little Polish woman could handle with ease two instruments, and sing like an angel besides, borders on the fantastic. Geraldine Morgan is an admirable violin artiste who plays solo as well as quartet with equal authority. Maud Powell has fulfilled her early promise. She is a mature artiste, one who will never be finished, because she will always study, always improve. A Joachim pupil, she is nevertheless a pupil of Maud Powell, and her playing reveals breadth, musicianship, beauty of tone, and phrasing. She is our greatest American violin virtuosa. I wrote this of Misha Elman, the first of the many Mishas and Yashas who mew on the fiddle strings, after I heard him play in London. United to an amazing technical precision, there is a still more amazing emotional temperament, all dominated by a powerful musical and mental intellect, uncanny in one not yet out of his teens. What need to add that his conception of Beethoven is neither as lovely as Chrysler's nor as fascinating as Issei's. Elman will mature. In the romantic or the virtuoso realm he is past master. His tone is lava-like in its warmth. He paints with many colors. He displays numberless nuances of feeling. 
the musical in him dominates the virtuoso. Naturally, the pride of hot youth asserts itself, and often, self-intoxicated, he intoxicates his audiences with his sensuous, compelling tone. Hebraic, tragic, melancholy, the boisterousness of the Russian, the swift modulation from mad caprice to Slavic despair, Elman is a magician of many moods. When I listen to him, I almost forget Issei. Yet when I heard Issei play last season, it was Elman that I forgot for the moment. After all, a critic too may have his moods. And now comes another conqueror, the lad Yasha Heifetz from Russia, a pupil of Leopold Auer and an artist of such extraordinary attainments that the greatest among contemporary violinists is it necessary to mention names? Have said of him that his art begins where theirs ends, and that they will shut up shop when he plays here. All of which is a flattering tribute, but it has been made before. Heifetz, however, may be the dark horse in the modern fiddle sweepstakes. End of chapter 28「Chapter Twenty Nine of Unicorns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Unicorns by James Hunnaker. Chapter Twenty Nine. Riding the Whirlwind. Once Swinburne, in a Baudelaire mood, sang, Shall no new sin be born for men's troubles? And it was an Asiatic potentate who offered a prize for the discovery of a new pleasure. Or was it a sauce? Mankind soon wearies. The miracles of yesteryear are the commonplaces of today. Steam, telegraphy, electric motors, wireless, and now wireless telephony are accepted as a matter of course by the man in the street. How stale will seem woman's suffrage and prohibition after they have conquered. In the world of art, conditions are analogous. The cubist nail drove out the impressionist, and the cubist will vanish if the futurist hammer is sufficiently heavy. Nevertheless, there is a novel sensation in store for those who make a first flight through the air. I don't mean in a balloon, whether captive or free. In the case of the former, a trip to the top of the Washington Monument or the Eiffel Tower will suffice. And while I rode a Zeppelin at Berlin in 1912, for a hundred marks or about twenty-five dollars, that was the tariff, and saw Potsdam at my feet, yet I was unsatisfied." The passengers sat in a comfortable salon, ate, drank, even smoked. The traveling was so smooth as to suggest an inland lake on a summer day. No danger was to be apprehended. The monster airship left its hangar and returned to it on schedule time. The entire trip lacked the flavor of adventure, and that leads me to a personal confession. I am not a sport. In my veins flows sporting blood, but only in the Darwinian sense am I a sport a deviation from the normal history of my family, which has always been devoted to athletic pleasures. A baseball match in which carnage ensues is a mild diversion for me. I can't understand the fury of the contest. I yawn, though the frenzied enthusiasm of the spectators interests me. I have fallen asleep over a cricket match at Lord's in London, and the biggest bore of all was a Sunday afternoon bullfight in Madrid. It was such a waste of potential beefsteaks. Prize fights discussed, shell races are puerile, football matches smack of obituaries. As for golf, that is a prelude to senility or the antechamber to the undertaker's establishment. The swiftness of film pictures has sent a new metronomic standard for modern sports. I suppose playing Bach fugues on the keyboard is as exciting a game as any, that is, for those who like it. A four-voiced polyphony at a good gate is positively hair-raising, it beats poker. All this is a preliminary to my little tale. Conceive me as an elderly person of generous waist measurement, slightly reckless like most nearsighted humans. This recklessness is psychical. Safety first, and I always watch my step. Painful experience taught me years ago the perils that lurk in ambush for a Johnny look in the air. Flying in heavier-than-air machines fascinated me. The fantastic stories of H.G. Wells were ever a joy. When the Argonauts of the air appeared, flying was practically assured. 
although a Paris mathematician had demonstrated with ineluctable logic that it was impossible, as proved a member of the Institute a century earlier that birds couldn't fly. It was an illusion. Well, the Wrights flew, even if Langley did not. Langley, the genuine father of the aeroplane. Living so long in France and Belgium, I had grown accustomed to the whirring of aerial motors, a sound not unlike that of a motorboat or the buzzing of a sawmill. I became accustomed to this drone above the housetops, and since my return to America, I have often wondered why in the land where the aeroplane first flew so little public interest was manifested. To be sure, there are aero clubs, but they never fly where the interest of the greater public can be intrigued. Either there is a hectic excitement over some record broken, or else the aviator sulks in his tent. Is the money devil at the bottom of the trouble? Sport for sport's sake, like art for art's sake, is rarely encountered. The government has taken up flying, but that is for pragmatic purposes. The aeroplane as a weapon of defense, not the aeroplane as a new and agreeable pleasure. We are not a disinterested nation. Even symphony concerts and opera and the salvation of souls are commercial propositions. Else would our skies be darkened by flying machines instead of smoke, and our churches thronged with aviators. Walking on the famous and fatiguing boardwalk of Atlantic City, I suddenly heard a familiar buzzing in the air and looked up. There it was, a big flying boat like a prehistoric dragonfly, speeding from the inlet down to the million-dollar pier. Presently, there were two of them flying, and I felt as if I were in a civilized land. On the trolleys were signs, See the flying boats in the inlet. I did, the very next morning. I had no notion of being a passenger. I was not tempted by the thought. But, as Satan finds work for idle hands, I lounged down the beach to the Kendrick biplane and stared my full at its slender proportions. A young man in a bathing suit explained to me the technique of flying and insinuated that hundreds and hundreds had flown during the season without accident. Afternoon saw me again on the sands, an excited witness of a flight. Excited, because I stood behind the motor when it started for a preliminary tryout. Tuning up is the slang phrase of the profession. And the cyclonic gale blew my hat away, loosened my collar, and made my teeth chatter. Such a tornadic roar. I firmly resolved that never would I trust myself in such a devil's contrivance. Why, it was actually riding the whirlwind, and perhaps reaping a watery grave. What else but that? On a blast of air you sail aloft and along. When the air ceases, you drop, less than 45 miles an hour, and this in a flimsy box kite. Never for me. Not today, Baker. Call tomorrow with a crusty cottage, as we used to say in dear old London years ago. Nevertheless, the poison was in my veins. Cunningly it began to work. I saw a passenger, a fat man, weighing 204 pounds, I asked the figures, trussed up like a calf in the arms of a slight, muscular youth who carried him a limp burden and deposited him on a seat in the prow of the boat. I turned my head away. I am not easily stirred, having reported musical and theatrical happenings for a quarter of a century, but the sight of that stout male, a man and a brother, I didn't know him from Adam, evoked a chord of pity in my breast. I felt that I would never set eyes again on that prospective food for fishes. I quickly left the spot and returned to my hotel, determined to say, Retro me, Satanus, if that personage should happen to show me his hoofs, horns, and hide. But he did not. The devil is a subtle beast. He had simply set jangling the wires of suggestion, and my nerves accomplished the rest. One morning, a few days later, I awoke, parched with desire. I drank much strong tea to steady me and smoked unremittingly. Again, during the early afternoon, I found myself up the beach. My feet take hold on hell, I said to myself, but it was only hot sand. I teased myself with speculations as to whether the game was worth the candle. Yes, I had got that far, traversing a vast mental territory between the no-sayer and the yes-sayer. I was doomed and I knew it when I began to circle about the machine. Courteously, the bonny youth explained matters. It was a Glen H. Curtis hydro-airplane, 
furnished with one of the new Curtis engines of 90 horsepower, capable of flying 70 to 90 miles an hour, of lifting 400 pounds, and weighing in at about a ton. Was it safe? Were the taut, skinny piano wires that manipulated the steering gear and the plane durable? Didn't they ever snap? Of course they were durable, and of course they occasionally snapped. What then? Why, you drop in spiral fashion, volplane, charming vocable. But if the engine? Same thing. You would come to earth, rather water, as naturally as a child takes to the breast. Nothing to fear. Young Beryl Kendrick is an Atlantic City product. He was a professional swimmer and lifeguard, and will look after you. The price is $15, formerly $25, but competition, which is said to be the life of trade, has operated in favor of the public. Rather emotionally, I bade my man good day, promising to return for a flight the next morning, a promise I certainly did not mean to keep. This stupendous announcement he received coolly, flying, to him, was a quotidian banality. And then I noticed that the blazing sun had become darkened. Was it an eclipse, or were some horrid, monstrous shapes like the supposititious spindles spoken of by Langley devouring the light of our parent planet? No, it was the chamber of my skull that was full of shadows. The obsession was complete. I would go up, but I must suffer terribly in the interim. Why should I fly and pay fifteen good shekels for the unwelcome privilege? I computed the cost of various beverages and, as a consoling thought, recalled Mark Twain's story of the Western editor who, missing from his accustomed haunts, was later found serenely drunk, passionately reading to a group of miners from a table his lantern-illuminated speech in which he denounced the cruel, raw waste of grain in the making of bread when so many honest men were starving for whiskey. Yet did I feel that I would not begrudge my hard-earned royalties. I'm not a bestseller and thus tormented between the devil of cowardice and the deep sea of curiosity, I retired and dreamed all night of fighting strange birds that attacked me in an airplane. I shan't weary you with the further analysis of my soul states during this tempestuous period. I ate a light breakfast, swallowed much tea. Then I resolutely went in company with a friend, and we boarded an inlet car. I had, the day previous, resorted to a major expedient of cowards, I had said, so as to bolster up my fluttering resolution, that I was going to fly, an expedient that seldom misses, for I should never have been able to face the chief clerk, the head waiter, or the proprietor of the hotel, if I had failed to keep my promise. Boaster, swaggerer, I muttered to myself en route, now are you satisfied? Thou tremblest, carcass, thou wouldst tremble much more if thou knewest whither I shall soon lead thee. I quoted Touraine. I was beginning to babble something about Icarus, or was it Phaeton, or, or Simon Magus, brought to earth in the Colosseum by a prayer from the lips of St. Peter when we arrived. How I hated the corner where we alighted. It seemed mean and dingy and sinister in the dazzling sunlight. A red-hot Saturday, September 11th, 1915, and the hour was 10.30 a.m., a condemned criminal would not have noted more clearly every detail of the life he was about to quit. We plowed through the sand. We reached the scaffold. At least it looked like one to me. Hello, here's a church. Let's go in. I felt like exclaiming in sheer desperation, remembering Dickens and Mr. Wemmick. I would have, such was my blue funk, quoted Holy Scripture to the sandlopers. But I hadn't the chance. I asked my friend and my voice sounded steady enough, whether the wind and weather seemed propitious for flying. Never better, was the reply, and my heart went down to my boots. I really think I should have escaped if a stout man with a piratical mustache hadn't approached me and asked, going up today? I marveled at his calmness and wished for his instant dissolution, but I gave an affirmative shake of the head, cornered at last. Handing my watch, hat and wallet to my friend, I coldly awaited the final preparations. I had forgotten my ear protector, but cotton wool would answer the purpose of making me partially deaf to the clangorous vibration of the propeller blades, which resemble in a magnified shape the innocent air fans of offices and cafes. I essayed one more joke, true gallows humor, before I was led like a lamb, a tough one, to the slaughter. 
I asked an attendant to whom I had paid the official fee if my widows would be refunded the money in case of accident, but this antique and tasteless witticism was indifferently received, as it deserved. Finally, the young man gave me a raincoat, grabbed me around the waist, and bidding me clasp his neck, he carried me out into shallow water and sat me beside the air pilot, who looked a mere lad in his bathing clothes. My hand must have been trembling. Ah, that old piano hand, for he inquiringly eyed me. The motor was screaming as we flew through the water toward the inlet. I hadn't courage of mind to make a farewell signal to my companion. Too late, we're off, I thought, and at once my trepidation vanished. I had, for some unknown reason, possibly because of absolute despair, suffered a rich sea change. We churned the waves. I saw tiny sails studding the deep blue. Men fished from the shore. As we neared the inlet where a shambling wooden hotel stands on the sandy point, the sound of the motor grew intenser. We began to lift, not all at once, but gradually. Suddenly, her nose poked skyward, and the boat climbed the air with an ease that was astonishing. No shock, no jerkiness. We simply glided aloft as if the sky were our native heath. You will pardon the hibernicism. As if determined to pay a visit to the round, blazing sun bathing naked in the brilliant blue... And, with the mounting ascent, I became unconscious of my corporeal vesture. I had become pure spirit. I feared nothing. The legend of angels became a certainty. I was on the way to the fourth-dimensional vista. I recalled Poincaré's suggestion that there is no such thing as matter, only holes in the ether, nature embracing a vacuum instead of abhorring it, a Swiss cheese universe. Joseph Conrad has said, man on earth is an unforeseen accident which does not stand close investigation. But man in the air? Man is destined to wings. Was I not proving it? Flying is the sport of gods, and should be of humans, now that the motor car has become slightly promiscuous. The inlet and thoroughfare at my feet were a network of silvery ribbons. The heat was terrific, the glare almost unbearable, but I no longer sneezed. Aviation solves the hay fever problem. The wind forced me to clench my teeth. We were hurled along at 70 miles an hour and up several thousand feet, yet below the land seemed near enough to touch. As we swung across the masts of yachts, I wondered that we didn't graze them. So elusive was the crystal clearness of the atmosphere, a magic mirror that made the remote contiguous. The mast of the sunken schooner hard by the sandbar looked like a lead pencil one could grasp and write a message to Mars. Hello! I was become lyrical. It is inescapable up in the air. The blood seethes. Ecstasy sets in. The kinetic ecstasy of a spinning top. I gazed at the pilot. He twisted his wheel nonchalantly as if in an earthly automobile. I looked over the sides of the cedar boat and was not giddy, for I have lived years at the top of an apartment house, ten stories high, from which I daily viewed policemen killing time on the sidewalks. Besides, I have strong eyes and the stomach of a drover. Therefore, no giddiness, no nausea, only exaltation as we swooped down to lower levels. Atlantic City, bizarre yet meaningless, outrageously planned and executed, stretched its ugly shape beneath us. The most striking objects were the exotic hyphenated hotel with its Asiatic monoliths and dome, and its vast, grandiose neighbor, a mound of concrete, the biggest hotel in the world. The piers were salient silhouettes. A checkerboard seemed the city, which modulated into a tremendous arabesque of ocean and sky. I preferred to stare seaward. The absorbent cotton in my ears was transformed into gun cotton, so explosive the insistent drumming of the motor engine. Otherwise, we flew on an even keel, only an occasional dip and a sidewise swing reminding me that I wasn't footing the ordinary highway. The initial intoxication began to wear off, but not the sense of freedom, a glorious freedom, Truly, mankind will not be free till all fly. Alas, though we become winged, we remain mortal. We may shed our cumbersome pedestrian habits, but we take up in the air with us our petty souls. I found myself indulging in very trite thoughts. What a pity that war should be the first to degrade this delightful and stimulating sport. Worse followed. Why couldn't I own a machine? Base envy, you see. The socialistic leaven had begun to work. No use. We shall remain human, even in heaven or hell. I have been asked to describe the sensation of flying. I can't. It seems so easy, so natural. If you've ever dreamed of flying, I can only say that your dream will be realized in an airplane. 
dreams do come true sometimes. Curiously enough, I've not dreamed of flying since. But as there is an end, even to the most tedious story, so mine must finish. Suddenly, the sound of the engine ceased. The silence was thrilling, almost painful. And then in huge circles, as if we were descending the curves of an invisible corkscrew, we came down, the bow of the flying boat pointing at an angle of 45 degrees. Still no dizziness, only a sense of regret that the trip was so soon over. It had endured an eternity, but occupied precisely 21 minutes. We reached the water and settled on the foam like a feather. Then we churned toward the beach. Again, I was carried, this time onto solid land, where I had ridiculous trouble in getting the cotton from my harassed eardrums. Perhaps my hands were unsteady, but if they were, my feet were not. I reached the inlet via the boardwalk, making record time, and drew the first happy sigh in a week as I sat down, lighted a cigar, and twiddled my fingers at a waiter. Even if I had enjoyed a new pleasure, I didn't propose to give up the old ones. Then my nerves. And when I meet Gabriel de Nuncio, I can look him in the eye. He flew over Trieste, but I flew over my fears. A moral as well as a physical victory for a timid conservative. End of chapter 29 Recording by Olivia. Chapter 30 of Unicorns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Unicorns by James Hunnaker. Chapter 30 Prayers for the Living. From the editorial page of the New York Sun, December 31, 1916. It is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins, and it is as holy a prayer that begs from the God of chance his pity for the living. I, it is those who are about to live, not to die, that we should salute life is the eternal slayer death is but the final punctuation of the vital paragraph life is also the betrayer a cosmical conspiracy of deception encircles us we call it maya and flatter our finite sense of humour that we are no longer entrapped by the shining appearance of things when we say aloud stay thou art so subtle that we know you for what you are the profoundest instinct of life is cruel delight in pretending to be what it is not we are now all of us who think that we think newly born fausts with eyes unbandaged of the supreme blinders time and space nature clothes the skeleton in a motley suit of flesh but our super sharpened ears overhear the rattling of the bones we are become so wise that love itself is no longer a sentiment only a sensation religion is first cousin to voluptuousness and if we are so minded we may jig to the tune of the stars up the dazzling staircase and sneer at the cloud gates of the infinite inane naught succeeds like negation and we swear that in the house of the undertaker it is impolite to speak of shrouds we are nothing if not determinists and we believe that the devil deserves the hindmost we live in order to forget life for our delicate machinery of apperception there is no longer right or wrong vice and virtue are the acid and alkali of existence and as too much acid deranges the stomach so vice corrodes the soul and thus we are virtuous by compulsion yet we know that evil serves its purpose in the vast chemistry of being and if banished the consequences might not be for universal good other evils would follow in the train of a too comprehensive mitigation and our end a stale swamp of vain virtues resist not evil which may mean the reverse of what it seems to preach the master modern 
immoralist has said embrace evil that we may be over and done with it toys are our ideals glory goodness wealth health happiness all toys except health health of the body of the soul and the first shall be last the human soul in health but there is no spiritual health the mystic dr taller has said god does not reside in a vigorous body sinister nevertheless equitable the dolorous certitude that the most radiant of existences ends in the defeat of disease and death that happiness is relative a word empty of meaning in the light of experience and non-existent as an absolute that the only divine oasis in our feverish activities is sleep sleep the prelude to the profound and eternal silence why then this gabble about soul states and the peace that passeth all understanding simply because the red corpuscles that rule our destinies are when dynamic mighty breeders of hope if the powers and principalities of darkness prevail our guardian angels the phagocytes are dominated by the leucocytes gods and devils or moosed and Araman, and other phantasms of the sky may all be put on a microscopic slide and their struggles noted and the evil ones are ever victors in the diabolical game no need to insist on it in the heart of mankind there is a tiny shrine with its burning taper the idol is self the propitiatory light is for subliminal foes alas in vain we succumb and in our weakness we sink into the grave if only we were sure of the river styx afterward we should pay the fairy tax with joy better hades than the poppy of oblivion ready to be anything in the ecstasy of being ever as sir thomas brown sagely remarks the pious and worthy dr jeremy taylor who built cathedral-like structures of english prose to the greater glory of god and for the edification of ambitious rhetoricians has dwelt upon the efficacy of prayer in a singularly luminous passage holy prayer procures the ministry and services of angels it rescinds the decrees of god it cures sickness and obtains pardon it arrests the sun in its course and stays the wheels of the chariot of the moon it rules over all god's creatures and opens and shuts the storehouses of rain it unlocks the cabinet of the womb and quenches the violence of fire it stops the mouths of lions and reconciles our sufferance and weak faculties with the violence of torment and sharpness of persecution it pleases god and supplies all our needs but prayer that can do this much for us can do nothing at all without holiness for god heareth not sinners but if any man be a worshipper of god and doth his will him he heareth it should not be forgotten that taylor perhaps the greatest english prose master save john milton was a stickler for good works as well as faith he was considered almost heterodox because of his violence of speech when the subject of deathbed repentance became a topic of discussion indeed his bishop remonstrated with him because of his stiff-necked opinions to joust through life as at a pleasure tournament and when the dews of death dampened the forehead to call on god in your extremity seemed to this eloquent divine an act of slinking cowardice far better face the evil one in a defiant spirit than knock for admittance at the back door of paradise and try to sneak by the winged policeman into a vulgar bliss unwon unhoped for undeserved therefore the rather startling statement god heareth not sinners 
read in the light of bishop taylor's fervent conception of man's duty hath its justification but this atmosphere of proverbial commonplaces and inspissated gloom should not be long maintained when the courses of the sun are plunging southward in the new year when the huntsman is up at oyster bay and they are already past their first sleep in persia what a bold and adventurous piece of nature is man yet how he stares at life as a frowning entertainment why must we act our antipodes when all africa and her prodigies are in us ergo let us be cheerful god is with the world let us pray that during the ensuing year no rest shall colour our soul into a dingy red let us pray for the living that they may be loosed from their politics and see life steadily and whole let us pray that we may not take it on ourselves to feel holier than our neighbours let us pray that we be not cursed with the itching desire to reform our fellows for the way of the reformer is hard and he always gets what he deserves the contempt of his fellow-men he is usually a hypocrite let us pray that we are not struck by religious zeal religious people are not always good people good people are not envious jealous penurious censorious or busybodies are too much bound up in the prospect of the mote in their brother's eye and unmindful of the beam in their own furthermore good people do not unveil with uncharitable joy the faults of women have faith have hope and remember that charity is as great as chastity let us pray for the misguided folk who forgetful of mother church her wisdom her consolations flock to the tents of lewd itinerant mumbo-jumbo howlers that blaspheme the sacred name as they epileptically leap shouting glory kingdom come and please settle at the captain's office though they run on all fours and bark as hyenas they shall not enter the city of the saints being money changers in the temple and tripe sellers of souls better tophet and its burning pitch than a wilderness of such apes of god some men and women of culture and social position endorse these sorry buffoons the apology for their paradoxical conduct being any port in a storm any degrading circus so it be followed by a mock salvation but salvation for whom what deity cares for such foaming at the mouth such fustian conversion is silent and comes from within and not to the din of brass bands and screaming hallelujahs it takes all sorts of gods to make the cosmos but why return to the antics and fetishes of our primate ancestors the cave dwellers this squirming and panting and brief reform true religion on the contrary it is a throwback to bestiality to the vilest instincts a soul that has to be saved by such means is a soul not worth the saving to the discard with it where flaming in purgatorial fires it may be refashioned for future reincarnation on some other planet abusive drink is to be deplored but prohibition is more enslaving than alcohol paganism in its most exotic forms is preferable to this prize-ring christianity one may be zealous without wallowing in debasing superstition again let us pray for these imbeciles and for the charlatans who are blinding them neither arts and sciences nor politics and philosophies will save the soul the azure root lies beyond the gates of ivory and the gates of horn let us pray for our sisters the suffragettes who are still suffering from the injustice of man now some million of years let us pray that they be given the ballot to prove to them its utter futility as a cure-all with it they shall be neither happier nor different once a woman always a martyr let them not be deceived by elusive phrases if they had not been oppressed they would to-day be free alas free from their sex free from the burden of family free like men to carry on the rude labours of this ruder earth to what purpose to become second-rate men when nature has endowed them with qualities that men vainly emulate vainly seek to evoke their spirit in the arts and literature 
ages past woman should have attained that impossible goal oppression or no in fact adversity has made man what he is and woman too pray that she may not be tempted by the mirage into the desert there to perish of thirst for the promised land nearly a century ago georges Saint was preaching the equality of the sexes and rightly enough what has come of it the vote political office professions business opportunities yes all these things but not universal happiness woman's sphere stale phrase is any one she hankers after but let her not deceive herself her future will strangely resemble her past william dean house was not wrong when he wrote woman has only her choice in self-sacrifice and sometimes not even the choosing why why are eclipses why are some men prohibitionists why do hens cluck after laying eggs let us pray for warring women that their politically ambitious leaders may no longer dupe them with fallacious promises surely a pathetic fallacy but then females rush in where fools fear to tread and lastly beloved sisters and brothers let us heartily pray that our imperial democracy or is it a democratic empire our plutocratic republic or should we say republican plutocracy may be kept from war avoid the drums and tramplings of three conquests but by the eternal jehovah god of battles if we are forced to fight then let us fight like patriotic americans and not gently coo like pacifists and other sultry south winds a billion for preparedness but not a penny for pork say we and by the same token let us pray that those thundering humbugs and parasites who call themselves labor leaders the blind leading the blind forever vanish because of their contumacious acts and egregious bamboozling of their victims because of their false promises of an earthly paradise and a golden age they deserve the harshest condemnation like certain oriental discourses our little morality which began in the mosque has rambled not far from the tavern nevertheless let us pray for the living as well as the dead or a moose end of chapter thirty end of unicorns by james hunnaker